Hey everyone, and welcome to Sasquatch Theory. In this episode, we have Dwayne from the Chestnut Ridge area back for a part two interview. He is a very knowledgeable, incredible researcher with a lot of experience in the field. Although he has never seen a Sasquatch, he has interviewed many people from his area who have seen Bigfoot and have had numerous experiences with the creatures. So basically, he has been hot on their trail and has gotten to experience Bigfoot activity on multiple occasions. If you would like to hear part one, you can find a link in the description down below. Dwayne sent over some photos of his finds and I think they are really interesting. The large boulder up in a tree is a mystery and Dwayne claims he found the boulder near some tree structures. He has also found some really neat tree structures and I think it's like some type of shelter or they're just juveniles playing out in the woods. At the end of Dwayne's interview, I will play an audio recording that he shared with me. All right, guys, with all that being said, let's dive straight into this next interview with Dwayne from the Chestnut Ridge area. Hey, Dwayne, welcome to Sasquatch Theory. It's a pleasure to have you on the show again. How are you doing today? Hi, Miguel. I'm doing fine. It's great talking to you again. Thanks for inviting me back. Yeah, absolutely. On the first episode, you shared a lot of your experiences from the Chestnut Ridge area. You've seen some orbs and you've researched and followed up on a lot of experiences and encounters from around the area. If you would, Dwayne, let's just pick up where we left off and we'll go from there. Sure. I, uh, yeah, I sort of just touched the tip of the iceberg there, as they say, uh, to bring us together with part one. I, I happened, I watched part one, which thank you. It looked good. It sounded good. I enjoyed watching it, even though I don't listen to myself too often. I wanted to let your audience, your, your listeners know something about a couple of those, uh, photos that you were, uh, running in the background while we were talking and the one that it gives a little more clarification is the boulder and that has the dimensions uh, associated with it in the tree, perched in the tree. That come from uh, November of 2013. Uh, there's a, uh, I started in that area. That was a new area of research for me on top of Dairy Ridge where I had been doing research, like I say, since 2000, but I had not been in this particular area. So I decided in September of 2013 to check it out, go in there and see if there was any evidence of any sort, and turned out there was. I uh, come up by myself uh, on a Saturday, and I hiked into this area that was very dense wooded area, and I actually started finding uh, the large X structures, and uh, that's where I entered the woods at. I, it was actually a large X structure, and it was by, positioned beside a deer trail. So I followed this deer trail into the woods, and it took me about 125 yards in. I find an even larger X structure, and I'm like, wow, this is pretty great, because I had not even found Xs up on top of the mountain uh, all the months and years that I'd been up there. So I was really excited finding these Xs. So I'm standing there, and I'm, well, I went around, and I'm examining the area, hoping to find tracks or any associated evidence that would give credence to what this X is. And I did actually find a couple small arches that were bowed and tucked uh, close by. But as I'm standing there and I'm taking a picture of this one that's the largest one, and I think I sent you a picture of uh, that one X. It's, you know, it's about 15 feet high, uh, uh, full grown trees. And I'm taking a picture and I hear this coming over my head behind me, as I've heard before in other locations. And a rocket was about an inch in diameter, lands about five, six, seven feet from me to the right and rolls. And I look and I'm like, huh, now I walk over to it and I pick it up and I turn around. And I look behind me because I, I'm not, no one but me is up there. And I knew no one was playing with me. 
And I'm hoping I'll see something and nothing. Didn't see or hear anymore. So I turn around, I start taking more pictures, and all of a sudden, here comes another rock. And uh, I'm like, okay. <laughs> I turn around quick this time, hoping to see somebody or something. And I started walking in the direction that the rock come from, hoping to push somebody out or make them stand up and expose themselves. Well, at that time, all I can describe it and have described it since that day happened it was something, it sounded like a horse, the weight of a horse, size of a horse running directly away from me down into the woods uh, on two feet. And I couldn't see it because between me and where this running, whatever it was, uh, was occurring, there was a heavy thicket of uh, uh, rhododendron bushes because that's popular. That's the uh, one of the state bushes state trees or bushes up here in pennsylvania and they're everywhere they're plentiful and it was just obscuring my view i couldn't see so i started jogging and running in that direction i got through the rhododendrons and then i end up spending my rest of the day hiking down through the woods hoping to find tracks or have this thing throw more rocks or make its uh, presence known nothing happened i it was unfortunate nothing happened but it was my introduction into this location. So after I exited the woods, I didn't come back to that spot for about three weeks. And it was October now. And I did return and I came around a different direction. A gas line borders the uh, the, the wooded area on the other side of the uh, wood. Yeah, the acreage where I was at before. And it was a, it was a normal day. Nothing happened. Okay. So I didn't find anything. I come back about two or three weeks later. Now I'm in the November and uh, still 2013. And uh, I come in through the way I did in September up through the X's. And uh, I continue to the right instead of going the direction I had gone before to follow the whatever had run away from me. And I go down into this wooded area that's kind of a, it's really dense. And I'm hiking and I'm not seeing much of anything. I did find a couple of, uh, I don't even know what you call them. They're not so much an X, but like trees that had been pushed over and overlapping in the fork of another standing tree. I found a couple of those. And I mean, I'm like, well, those didn't just magically blow over together. <laughs> and I, so I was taking notes, you know, of things I was seeing, but it really wasn't anything there. Well, as I come down to another place I had not hiked before, there was a uh, a grassy kind of a fire break. I don't know if the game commissioner or a property owner or who had uh, cleared this area, but there was a pretty good opening between the tree line and to the left was this outcrop rock. It was like massive rocks jutting up, laying everywhere and some big rock cliff faced uh, rock uh, yeah, cliffs of granite and sandstone. And I'm like, wow, that really looks good. I'm going to have to you know go up here and check this out. So I walk over to this area and I had to be real careful. It was difficult navigating around these rocks. There was a lot of places where you put your foot and all of a sudden uh, the ground opened up underneath of you. It was uh, moss growing over a hole or a patch of leaves and tree branch. It was covering a hole. And next thing I know, you're ankle deep or knee deep in a hole. So you had to be real careful going around all of these rocks. And I'm up there just taking my time looking. And uh, as I continue for a while, it took me a long time, actually. I uh, come up to the base of the largest rock formation, which was probably about 30 feet high or more. And I happened to spot a cave. I knew it looked like a cave where I was standing looking. And it, as soon as I got up to it close, there was a cave there. And it was about four foot high and about three foot wide. And I got down and uh, I took my flashlight and I looked inside and it went back a <laughs> pretty good distance. I thought, well, I got to check this out and see if there's anything been in here. It wasn't anything visible from the outside looking in. So I got down and uh, I crawled all the way back about 20, 25 feet. And uh, other than just dampness and and the, the, the mustiness of the cave, there was nothing in there that even looked like anything had been inhabiting it. So when I came back out, uh, I hadn't noticed it when I went in. But when I came back out, I spotted a track off to the right about five foot, six foot up from the, uh, going up the slope away, going away from the cave. So I come out and I get down and I start measuring and examining sure enough, 14 by seven. And it was a pretty decent track. 
you could it was in the leaf uh, cl- uh, fodder, but you could you could easily make out that it was a foot shaped print. So I'm examining that, and I took pictures, and I uh, put powder in it, and then I looked to my left where I'm while I'm down on looking at this one, and there was another one about four feet, and then there was another one about another four feet, and it was something had walked with about a four foot stride until it reached where there was a moss covered hillside slope about 15 feet, 12 to 15 feet high, very steep. Uh, and you could see an impression. And I sent you that picture. Uh, I put powder in those tracks because it enhances them for the camera. Because when you take a normal uh, photo with the camera, it just, it, it just distorts it when you try to show it to somebody from an image. So I put powder on these and took pictures and I, I was finding that pretty intriguing. Plus, there was a tree, a sapling, about inch and a half, two inch diameter tree that something had twisted it really with some strength and bowed it over. And I used that tree to pull myself up the side of the hill. Well, I thought this was pretty cool to find this cave and these tracks. And I thought, OK, this looks believable to me. So I continued examining the area, found a couple more caves that weren't as large, didn't go back as deep as that when I had crawled in. And that was about it for the day. I I documented it all. And then the next Saturday, I brought a friend with me who wanted to see the cave and see the tracks. So we go up there and uh, we re-step all the places I had been on that Saturday. And Tom, this is his name, he decided he wanted to go up on top of the uh, rock, uh, the cliff, the little rock ledge. He said, I'm going to go up. And we had radios. And he said, if I see anything that looks like an indention or a cave-like uh, ap- uh, opening, I'll holler at you and let you know and give you the direction how to get over to it, and then I'll come back down. And so away he goes, and 15 minutes or so go by. He's on the radio. Dwayne, you got to come up here. You need to come up here now and see what I, what I have found. So I didn't want to go up there because it was all these saw briars. It was difficult climbing up this slope and steep uh, it took me a while to get up there. And as I go up, there's this boulder, this, what I have the picture there, the 30 by 18, we measured it because it stayed up there for a long time. We examined that boulder almost, I was babysitting it for almost continuously for our four months, uh, before it finally fell out of the tree. And, uh, we got all kind of measurements. We couldn't really get to this boulder. It was about 10 feet up in the air. And the tree was positioned between a fracture of, of a outcrop rock wall. And it, we measured that uh, rudimentary measurement was like 52 feet. And this boulder was perched in the forks of the tree at the top. And there was nothing that was one of the tallest uh, uh, structures or any, you know, tr- tallest anything in that area. There was no other rock cliffs. This rock did not bounce down and bounced by some chance into this tree. And it was not even in there that long because you could see the scars where something or someone had positioned it or thrown it in there. You could see where the bark was a little scuffed up and also it hadn't been there too long when Tom and I found it. So that was pretty cool. Now we found the cave. The cave was actually below this boulder in the tree. I mean, literally I didn't know the boulder was up there when I was in the cave the week before but we start putting it all all together and uh, we're examining this location. And then we let that be our uh, place, our focus uh, place, our interest. So we would come back up there together or either separately and scout that area out. And really nothing much was happening following the boulder find and the cave find. But going forward in 2015, I, I had been going other places in between all of this and exam- doing follow-ups on reports and examining other areas, I returned back to this location just to see if anything new might show have shown up. And as I'm walking through the woods, because I came up through where the X's were, returned the same path to go into the direction of the boulder. When I came to where I said somebody had cleared out, the, it, it was just like a fire break. There's another path that was there at that location that I had not really gone down in the past for reasons unknown. I had stepped in the woods there for a short little distance just to see what was below, but I didn't examine that location too much. Well, and I got to this grassy area, there's this massive X 
one of the biggest X's I've ever seen was positioned across that trail, that deer trail. And there's an arch and then about 10 feet in the air was a snap, a break, and it was twisted in the smithereens still attached to the tree. Well, I, I take all the pictures I can and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm going to go down this trail. There must be something down here. I'm going to see what it is. So I go down this trail all the way to the bottom. I walk around. I'm down there for probably almost an hour uh, scouting along the spring fed Creek bank and, and just looking, having good time because it was a little paradise down there it was beautiful beautiful uh location uh but there was nothing special so i come back up and i'm really about to leave the wood thinking i'm gonna head back toward my car and leave the woods was i'm a there's a, another rhododendron cluster along this trail and it encapsulates anybody that's on this trail you can't see on either left or right side and the only thing you can see is really just one direction of the trail you're standing on, the little deer trail, because the other one kind of goes around just a little tiny, tiny bend, and it's it obscures. So you're looking at a wall of rhododendron around you practically three-quarter of the way around, except for that one little entrance. And I'm walking back into there, and, I, and my phone rang, which was amazing because we didn't have phone service up there in that area too often or ever. And I, so I, I thought, yeah, it's a good place to take a break have some water, um, and, and talk to my friend a second. And I stopped right in the middle of this rhododendron cluster. And I'm talking to him and just telling him what I'm doing. And all of a sudden, to my left, I hear a couple snaps. And then a, a, it sounds like something heavy takes a step. And it's, that's when that feeling of dread comes over top of me. And I don't have that. Usually, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, a def- I'm a person that doesn't have any fear of much of anything. And I stopped and I said, Cliff, that was his name, the guy I was talking to. I said, Cliff, I'm going to keep you on the phone. I'm going to keep walking. If you hear anything, you call the authorities and tell them to come to Dairy Ridge. I said, but there's something, and I'm getting a weird feeling right now, and I'm going to get out of where I'm standing and hope that I'm going to be okay in about two minutes. So I just kept walking and broke back out into that grassy area, and it all went away, and I didn't have any other problem. But that was all happening associated with the region where the boulder in the tree was at and then without covering all the timelines between there and in the middle of 2016 we don't know what happened but me and another friend another bigfoot researcher went up there and we had not really been back to that area in give or take eight months to ten months other than driving around the mountain uh, in another area we hadn't examined that or been anywhere on that property for a while Uh, because other things were coming into us that we had to follow up and do research on. And we we arrive up there to go back to the boulder area, go back to all, return to these areas. And we find the whole, almost like 25 acres of land has been stripped. It's clear cut. All the major logs, all the timber, everything is just gone. And no trespassing signs have been posted. And we're like, wait a minute. (laughs) This is the same spot where all this activity was happening at. And everything around it is still intact. No, no one's touched it. And I'm like, what in the world are they doing? But everything around the boulder, everything around every place I had walked since 2013 had been stripped, was gone. And no, and I called my friends who I know with the game commission and asked them is, uh, did someone have a, a tree fungus or was there some kind of, did they want to do my strip mining or what was going on? They said, we don't know. So we, discovered <laughs> the land being cut down, clear cut it the same way you're discovering it. We didn't know. It said no one come to us and made us aware that they were going to cut all those trees down and put and post uh, uh, no trespassing signs. So I found that to be very strange. And ever since then, it still looked pretty ugly and nasty in that area. But we do our research around that location uh, because that's where we've heard some howls and some screams over the last couple of years and uh, found some tracks and that's where i was telling you in the last uh, uh part one conversation that we saw this figure walk up to the edge of the slope in the uh flare in the heat thermal image and then disappeared in front of us all of that is right there at the foot of this other location where the boulder and the cave and everything were are are and and all this clear cutting occurred so there's something really strange there yeah, it sounds like it. Do you think they maybe logged the forest on purpose? That's what I think, and I've talked to a couple other uh, research 
persons that I know across the country. And that was their, immediately, that was their thoughts too. They, they said, whenever a Bigfoot, and again, a lot of this is hypothesis, but whenever a Bigfoot gets out of hand, they come in and clear the land to push them out. That's what they said. Now, I, I have no evidence to, to, you know, back that up, uh, but it makes sense because now there's nothing happening and it wouldn't put, it would definitely push a creature out of that location if they were inhabiting that and they were doing anything to cause trouble. Yeah, that makes sense. I've noticed the same in my areas and even here at home that neighbors will clear cut the forest and all of a sudden you got a lot of activity. So it's hard to say if, you know, they found the same thing and they were seeing something or having activity and decided to cut down the woods. That's for sure. I don't, I don't know. It, it would be it would be great to be able to talk to other people. Unfortunately, every time we've ever gone up there, we never see anyone. And the post-it signs didn't have any names or uh, phone numbers located. And the game commission wouldn't share any uh you know, contact information of the owner who would have been up uh, that we could call or get any information from. So it's another mystery, but very strange, very, very unusual how they came in and just destroyed the land. I mean, virtually they, they just knocked the trees down because some of the large timber, the heavy hard hardwood timber, they didn't even take it. It was just pushed over. They just destroyed the land for about 20 acres. Yeah, that is unusual. Um, I wanted to go back to where you were finding the X on the deer trails. I wanted to mention that a lot of the structures I find are next to game trails, food plots, and transition areas. Well, same here. Same here. We, uh, I've actually, as I was telling you before, if you use an IR thermal camera at night, these look like markers. I mean, in the daylight, they're visible, and you you can see them, and they're very obvious. Where and they are next to tra- deer trails. Most of all that I have found had a deer trail very, very close to where it was positioned at. So I don't know if that has any reference or relationship to the to a deer herd being in that area, and they're marking it so they'll know in the future that that's where they spotted deer, or are they letting other Bigfoot creatures know, hey, this is a good location for deer. I don't know, but yes, there are several <laughs> X's and the structures in general that are positioned almost on a deer trail. Yeah. One of the major structure areas I've found is right off a trail, right by a food plot, inside a pine forest, and right next to the river on top of a ridge. Well, I've got so many uh, pictures of, of, of X's and, and stackings and and everything, the arches. I mean, you you name the structure I found it, took pictures of it, and I found multiple examples of it in various locations. And it's just, after a while, you just get tired of, <laughs> I quit taking pictures and I just, I'd let somebody know, hey, I found an X up here, or hey, I found a twist and an arch. Uh, they're, they're, they're the same, they're almost templates of each other. And that's why when I sent you that little collage of uh, stru- of template of an- anomalies that I have taken pictures, those were my structures that I found. They were just an example. I used that in one of my presentations I did. And I said, this is what I find most of the time. The X's, there's some rarities that I find, but these are the ones that I always seem to stumble across in the woods that I go to. And they're not close to each other. We're not talking, you know, five miles across the woods we're talking 100 miles 75 miles uh in a whole nother wooded location and there's a same type of structures as if it's a a mirror image of what i found in another location and i'm like this is pretty great (laughs) i don't know what they all mean but uh whoever's doing them is is copying what i saw in another location to the almost to the exact dimension and and it's pretty amazing when well, I wish we knew what they meant, what they what they're meaning to each other are, because I don't think they're communicating to us. They they don't give humans any. I don't believe they do. I wouldn't think they care about a human finding this stuff. And most humans disregard it. Don't even look at things like that. Average person walking in the woods and the X's are a little bit obvious, but the rest of it, they would just completely walk right by it and disregard it. And I've had people with me that were not really into Bigfoot and that was the way they regarded it when I took them up to a 
very concernable, discernible looking uh, 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 structure and, and described it in detail to him. And even at the time had pictures on my phone or my tablet or whatever I had with me and showed the same structure at another location. I said, well, that's interesting. And they just kind of stretched it off. They didn't care. So the average human doesn't pay any attention to those things that we're noticing. And I think Bigfoot probably knows that. So I don't think any of these are put there for our benefit or or to prevent us from coming into an area. But again, we don't know that for sure. Well, anyway, uh, I was going to say something here because I know uh, I want to say thank you to all your uh, listeners who watched part one and make comments and compliments. Uh, thank you very much to each of you. I appreciate that myself. Um, uh, wanted to give a little quick history, a little geography of Chestnut Ridge and where, where my location is that I do my research here in Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvania is a large, one of the largest States in the United States. Uh, and I'm in the Southwestern quadrant, which, borders up against Ohio and borders up against West Virginia. And that's where I do my research at in counties in that particular area, about 12 different counties that I have done my research over the last uh, 25, 26 years. And uh, so when I say Chestnut Ridge, that is the upper northernmost area of the Appalachian Mountains. It runs for about 75 to 80 miles south down to Morgantown, West Virginia. And it's basically about 3,000 square miles in, in circumference and uh, uh, area space. And that is a, it, it is, if you go out and do online research now that the pop, uh, internet is populated with all these reports, there is a plethora of uh, research uh, being done in this area, going back into the, and reports being given since the uh, uh, 1800s, that are on the chestnut associated and on the chestnut ridge. Uh, so that's what keeps us, that's, you know, keeps us focused on the chestnut ridge is, uh, is that chestnut ridge has such a, a long history of Bigfoot and UFOs. So just wanted everybody to know where chestnut ridge is at because Pennsylvania is huge and I don't do any research on the uh, Eastern side of the state or up in the Northern side next to New York. We have people that I know and groups that go into those regions and we, try to share as much information with each other if there's a uh, report coming in that they an active report coming in that they are researching or investigating but that's not where my research takes place at okay well thank you for sharing that information and i know the viewers really appreciate everything that you're sharing with us well you're welcome and i'll just move on here a little bit i'm gonna give i've i've kind of I want to give some clarity to what I've had my background personally. And then some of these are what I consider to be really, really good, credible reports that included a witness face to face or eyewitness of a creature in Chestnut Ridge in either Westmoreland County or Fayette County. Those are the two counties I primarily do my research. And that's where these reports all came from. And some of them are mine. And unfortunately, as I said before, I have yet to see a blood and a flesh and blood creature. I wish I had. I, I mean, I would give anything to have your experience or any other person's experience. Uh, and it's almost like you can't beg this uh, and force this to happen. And you, I mean, as many times as I go out there and have been out there over the years, sitting, spending time, weekends in the woods thinking, okay, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Well, it doesn't happen. Nothing happens. Or we get the rock throwing, or we hear a, a wood knock in the woods. We might get that lucky, but we I've never seen the physical being, the creature, the hominid that does it uh, with my eyes, and I wish I had. And then you got somebody else, you know, a few weeks later or next week even, that's a pedestrian or or, or somebody uh, uh, that's riding a bike or somebody taking a trip uh through the woods on a car or, or something. And this thing runs out right in front of them. And I'm like, why me? Why not me? <laughs> I want to see this. And these people are terrified. And so over the years, I've almost begged my begged for that to happen, but here we are, <laughs> here we are, uh, 39 years since I've started this, uh, field research stuff. I, uh, I still yet to, I just see the remnants of it. I don't get to see the actual thing that's making the footprints and the, tree structures. So I 
I take what I get. I, I figure if they leave me a kind of, as the old saying goes, throw me a bone. So I'll keep coming back for more, hoping to see something more the next time. That's what, that's what I am. I'm the researcher that's looking for the more. <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm going to give you one here that, uh, I, I've got several in here that I think are, are very interesting that should be shared or would be good to share. But this one is, uh, occurred in November. Well, let's see. Let me look at where I'm at here. Let's, let's do this in chronological order. It might be better. Uh, the, again, up on Dairy Ridge uh, from 99 until 2004 was a super active area. And again, we're only basing that information or make, I'm only making that statement based on the limited amount of reports that we obtain because we really truly don't know if we got five or six reports as we were doing, averaging one a week or more, uh, sometimes it, some didn't lead to anything potential, uh, credible. So we disregarded it because a witness either disappeared or, uh, we couldn't follow up on it and find any evidence to support the report. Um, there wasn't a massive amount of activity going on and people of all statures was, reporting that they had seen these creatures crossing roads, moving through the woods, hearing howls on uh, uh, the people that had their homes that were uh, bordering, bordering up to the base of uh, Chestnut Ridge and Dairy Ridge were uh, reporting they were hearing these bellowing howls. And we'd go up into the woods or go talk to them and we'd find nothing. So we, we don't include all of those reports. We did at the time as just so we had substantial records. To say, hey, we had five reports in this period of time, or we had two in this period of time. So it was a very active location, and then it just sort of stopped, and uh, it's never returned to that level of activity again. But we keep getting occasional reports of certain things happening along that area. But uh, after the in the in the previous part one, I was talking about the tracks that I found with the other guys and that location, and and then. That same location uh, uh, is where the family encountered the Bigfoot up on the train tracks that had the flowing hair that I said looked like an orangutan and ran and had hair flowing like Fabian off its body. Well, that's all two miles or less than where I had it, where another occurrence happen. The first day of d uh, deer season, rifle season, uh, in November of 03, these two seasoned hunters, middle-aged guys, they were in their late 30s, early 40s, uh, had ATVs, and they're on this same uh, old logging road, and they're driving back like 4.30 in the morning to go to deer stands where they had hunted and knew this location very well, and as the guy in the front is coming, and it's kind of a, it's a curvy road, it's old, it's in good shape, and at the time, the public was allowed to drive on it. Now it's been sold and we're not allowed to take vehicles back there. And the game commission has resurfaced that road with gravel and put drainage ditches in. But at this time it was very rugged, had ditches, had mud holes. It was a mess, but you could drive it with a good off-road four wheel drive or a ATV. And these two guys had their rifles, you know, positioned in the front of them. And they're going back with one mindset. They're going to get a deer. As this guy in the front said, he was coming around this one curve. There stood this, he said, eight or more taller, very bulky, brown colored, hair cover, uh, covered, uh, hominid. <laughs> he said it was a Bigfoot. And it's just standing on the edge of the road of this, tr of this, this road. And it looking at them as they both drive by, it just stands there and looks at them as they go by. Like it's nobody doing anything unusual. And it scared these guys to death. And they both had high-powered rifles, and and uh, <laughs> they uh, they they left the woods. They would not even stay up in the woods, and they never they weren't going back. They said we got other places we can go deer hunting. We're not going back up here. And to my knowledge, they never did. But they called the uh, uh, game commission, and the game commission had contact with Stan Gordon, who is he's our area. He's southwestern Pennsylvania, well, Pennsylvania in general area research specialist who at that time had a he uh in 2004 he had a web page that he had developed and people were contacting him with reports and that's how the rest of us were getting our reports handed to us is through uh stan and uh 
they called uh, the game commission guys, gave these guys his uh, contact information. They contacted him, and that's how we found out. But they were terrified. They they see this <laughs> this massive creature standing there that they had no intention of dealing with and had no expectation of it being there. And they, they, they exited the woods and they never went back. So that was another very good report that happened up on Derry Ridge. And it, I remember very clearly going up there and walking those woods extensively, hoping to find evidence of what these guys had experienced. And unfortunately there was really nothing that showed up, but, um, uh, we, uh, we, 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 after that, after things sort of died down, we changed our, our location about 120 miles north of uh, where we had been on Dairy Ridge to Chestnut Ridge. I mean, to, uh, I'm sorry, not to Chestnut Ridge, to uh, Clearfield, which is positioned between Dubois and Clearfield, Pennsylvania. And uh, Moshannon Shannon State Forest is where we began our research area. Uh, uh, and we, a group of us, were meeting at that location that came in from some other locations, and that was our meeting location. And this this place had history of Bigfoot, even two uh, park rangers, or park, I don't, they were like the DNR guys, the, the Department of Natural Resources, actually witnessed a Bigfoot walking on a natural gas line in the late seventies where we were going to start doing our research at. So we thought, okay, but if there was ever a Bigfoot here, let's, let's hope it's still something here now. So in 2005, we went to that location and we started our research in nothing in special happening. We found some structures. We found some, uh, one was really special. We found a cantilever, uh, tree it looked like it was <laughs> barely, it, I don't even know how it was hovering it was like positioned over another tree and it was like 20 feet of it just out in the opening and whatever put it there knew that, and they tightened it just enough where you could touch it with your finger and it would bobble a little bit, but it was perfectly balanced in the fork of this tree. And we're like, well, this is cool, you know, but it was a big tree. Nobody, unless two or three guys would have picked it up and done that. It would have made no sense, but we were finding silly stuff like that. It, you know, that stood out. We knew it shouldn't be there. There's no way we believe that tree fell hap- just by happen chance that it ended up where it was a balanced tree like that. So anyway, we made 05 to 08, that area. We were all going up there at different times, nothing extensively, but we were uh, scouring different wooded areas up around there. And it was all, and then we were going up to Allegheny National Forest as well. And that area had had some reports come out of there. But we as a group were not really finding any credible evidence which was disappointing but it was still some beautiful woods to go in so that's what we were doing well in 08 a a six-week period in the same location where nothing of any real importance had happened or found been found we decided to go back up there and spend the weekend as we were there like on a saturday night into sunday morning and take camp and uh stay overnight so we all got up to this uh it's a natural gas line that goes through this wooded area and you are welcome to park your vehicles on this gas line. And it's, it's that way, you know, if you camp there, you're not going to bother anything or have trees or anything fall on you or anything. So we, uh, we picked that location and that's where we did our day hikes from. And then at night we set up and uh, had our camp. Well, we decided when we got there, we were all going to walk about 200 yards uh, up the gas line to a to a certain place it really had no it had no primary reason for doing it but we all chose this one location uh and the gas line you know is about 30 33 feet wide of it's a fire break it's just tall grass and we thought well we can hear and see here so we took our chairs our folding uh bag chairs and we went up there and we're sitting there the first night that we started this venture um uh, and really didn't have a whole lot of anything happening in, at, around the nine o'clock hour. And then around 11 o'clock, 1130 is when the rock throwing started. And we were all in a semicircle kind of pattern. A couple of people were standing up and had moved off away from us so they could hear. And were just kind of scouring the woods. But none of us had a flare at that time. None of us had any dominant uh, equipment to use. We had, I had, uh, some of us had some night vision goggles, 
but they you know, could only see about 25 yards out and that was nothing. That didn't help any. So we're all just sitting there and all of a sudden we hear this and another rock. It was almost like a big deer acorn size rock landed next to one of the people that was sitting over on the outer edge of the little semicircle ring that we were all gathered at. And it was a female and she said, I think something threw a rock at us and we're all hit. We heard the thud when it hit and, but we couldn't see anything. And we're like, well, let's see what's happening. Maybe we're getting some activity. Well, it wasn't another five or 10 minutes. Here come another rock. And it's, it landed within a foot or two. <laughs> it seemed like where the first one did, but we saw this one and it was, it was about an inch to two inch yeah, round little rock. And we're like, okay, we got some activity, something, somebody or something throwing rocks at us. But where we're at, we're out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, so some of the guys, they were like, well, you know, let's go, let's go over there and stand at the edge of the wood line and see if we can hear or see anything. And they did. And rocks kind of stopped for a little while. And then everybody settled down and here come the rock again. And that kept going on. We had like three or four rocks over about an hour period thrown at us. And we said, okay, it must be, if it's Bigfoot, it must be some young ones because they're just playing with us. Well, nothing really happened more than that that night. We didn't have too much else going on, but we were happy to have the rock throwing because we could say we had some activity. And we called it a night, went back to our camping little area, and we called it a night and slept and got up and left the next morning after we were in the woods for about an hour, and then we had nothing. Week later, we come back, same six of us. and. We did all the similar things we had done the week before. We were hoping if something saw us, it would be familiar with us this time and maybe be comfortable with our presence since we didn't harm it the last time we were there. So we just kind of dodled around and did our thing, talked and did everything normal. And we did the same thing. Go back up to the fire break. We're sitting up there and here come rocks again. Same about the same timeline. All of a sudden rocks started. Well, this time, the, the two guys that wanted to go over into the woods and push them or make them move, they decide they had brought some uh, high-power flashlights with them. They decide they're going to go see if they can get something to move away. So as soon as they stood up and they walked over to this tree line edge of the of the uh, fire break of the gas line that we're sitting on, and they hit the lights into the woods, a rock comes from the other direction. I mean, almost immediately it comes out of the other direction. Uh, like if we're looking, if that rocket was thrown behind or to our one direction would have been 12 o'clock. This would have been like seven o'clock to our other direction. And we're all, now that, that got our attention. We're like, wait a minute. Okay. You guys are, are pushing that one. And there's, it's got another one over here throwing rocks at you on the other direction. So that brought the guys back and we're watching this other direction. And now we're getting rocks from two directions. And we're like, okay, <laughs> this is starting to get real interesting. And uh, we're not hearing anything. We're not smelling anything. Nothing else is going on except the rocks, occasional rocks are coming. So uh, everybody just kind of just stayed quiet now and watched. Some of the guys got up and went over to, there was like a little ridge on this uh, fire break that if you walked about 100 feet, and it would slope down slightly, and then you could see down the fire break for a good Lord. I mean, several hundred yards until your view, uh, yeah, point of view is faded away. But uh, you had to move away from where we were to see that clear ahead. And they went over there, and there was enough illumination from the sky and the moon and uh, yeah, stars and moon and all. They were hoping to see something come out into the fire break and cross it or move or something but nothing happened like that and the rocks just suddenly quit they didn't last as long the second time so we did our thing again went back down to the area slept went to bed uh got up the next day and we left immediately we didn't hang around that time and well we got two days two weekends back to back with rock throwing in the same location to you know put in our reports well, we didn't make it back the next week because of weather and i don't know what but then we all some of us came back the fourth week there was a couple that couldn't make it and we did similar things that we had done and we chose that same location to come back to and we're doing the same sit out. Nobody had anything special going on. The rocks throw throwing started around 10, 1030 this time, but then we ended up with three. It was coming from three directions before it ended. And by the end of it, it was, uh, 
it, one come by my head and it come between me and another person like a like a line drive. I mean that that rock was buzzing, and it hit. There was a game management fence to the back of us at one place, and it hit the game management fence. And if you've ever hit a rock uh, off of a fence, it went zing. And we're like, that's it. We're out of here. You know, somebody's going to get hurt bad or something really. But they they got very aggressive. <laughs> and I thought, well, they would, you know, maybe be nice to us by the third time we we're there. But no, they started getting more aggressive. So we all packed it in and we went back and we called it a night and left the next day. And nothing's happening now in this one except <laughs> add more rock throwing. So we didn't come back the fifth week. Yeah, the fifth week in that series of six weeks we all couldn't make it back the uh, sixth week it was just me and a guy and his family that lives up in that area that showed up no all the rest of them were unavailable and we're in october now and it actually was a early fall a early co- coldness uh that was that weekend that we all showed that we showed up and we went back into the woods a different direction than all the other times we had been there and that's when i found the shelter, this massive, uh, twisted, bowed limbs all together. And you couldn't see it in the direction we were walking into this, toward this shelter. But when we passed it and we, I came back from a different direction, I spotted it and I went over and started examining. And sure enough, I went in, I crawled in under the limbs and stood up on the inside of it. And I can say this without stopping what I'm talking about this series right here later, Another like 2010, I went back up there on my own by myself and I went back to that location and there was leaves. These trees were all live that were twisted and and bowed together into this structure. And with the leaves on it, it was the best camo job I'd ever seen. You couldn't, you could almost walk up to the side of this uh, shelter, natural shelter, and you would not have seen it and, and, and almost could have stumbled on it if you didn't know it was there. So if that was made by these creatures as a temporary shelter, a temporary housing area, they had a good hiding place and no one would have spotted them. But anyway, getting back to what I was saying, after we found the shelter and we found some uh, other tree structures, Dave was the, is the guy's name. His family went home and left him and I, we were going to stay out in the and and do a night investigation well instead of us going up the gas line this time we decided to go down a, an old deer trail to where there was an opening and it was probably about 40 yards 30 40 yards from where we had our cars parked our vehicles parked on the gas line but it was pretty remote and the whole area is remote where we're at we're, we're two miles into the wilderness where we're at but it was very remote and we put our chairs out and both of us had night vision goggles and uh we set our place we set ourselves up there and we turned our chairs opposite of each other so i could, could watch one direction he could watch one direction and then we just sat there for a while and then after we got bored a little bit it was dark early we're now in october so it's dark like 5 36 o'clock this particular night and it was very dark by 7 38 o'clock we got up and we decided to walk away from our where we had been and just see if we heard anything and sure enough we didn't go we didn't go 25 30 yards away from our sitting location and we hear this deep guttural growl in the thicket to our left and dave heard it first he was ahead of me and he turned around he said wayne you hear that I didn't hear it when he heard it to start with, but then it made it again. And it sounded like it was on the ground, but what it was, I don't know. Cause we, we stood there and didn't make any sounds and we're listening and listening and listening. And it never happened again and nothing ran out. And it was just, it, it, it got us, you know, we were alert. Now we were listening. We're watching our, uh, we're using our night vision camera. We're looking to see, uh, or uh, monogoggles and we're, looking in that area and we're seeing no heat well you couldn't see heat signature with that but we saw nothing it looked like an outline of any kind of animal so after a few minutes we went back and sat back down so we're just sitting there and we're listening again and then we hear what sounds like a couple wood knocks if you're sitting on across this deer trail straight in front of us is a, a is is a wooded area and it slopes down continuously for about 40 yards and it goes down into a uh, dry creek bed and then it goes into some really thick woods over there and uh, we hear what looks sounds like a double wood knocks coming up from that ravine down in the bottom so uh, 
as we're sitting there, I said, you know, I'm going to go over and get closer. I'm going to see if I can, I'm going to do a wood knock and see if it'll respond. So Dave continues sitting in the chair. Now he's watching me with his night vision goggle. He can see me where I walk to do a wood knock and it's dark. Otherwise, I mean, in natural vision, it's very dark. And, uh, I did, I did just one single wood knock and I stood there and waited for a while. Nothing responded back. So I give up and I turn around and I'm walking slowly back to Dave and I don't have an answer for what this was, but, but as I'm about, I wasn't maybe 40, 50 feet from David, something threw a boulder the size of a bowling ball came out of the woods behind him and it landed with a massive thud behind the chair he's sitting in. And he was the only one carrying an all. Uh, he had his 40 caliber on his hip. And he come out of that chair like he had a springboard under him and he had his gun in his hand and he turned around. You thought he was a James Bond actor or something. The way he turned around, he was ready to open up on somebody. I mean, that boulder would have hit him. It was, we, we examined it when we finally come to our <laughs> calm down and figured out what it was, but, uh, it would have hurt somebody or killed somebody. If something would have hit, been hit by this boulder, it was just a gnarly, big nasty rocket something threw it out of the woods behind him and then i looked at him and he <laughs> he looked at me i said david i think we need to exit these woods i said they, they whatever it is doesn't want us here and if they're going to throw rocks like that i don't want to be here <laughs> so we got up and we left and i haven't done really any i've done one more night investigation in that location but uh that was that was really I got my heart pounding when that big rock come out of there. Cause I've had rocks thrown at me. Uh, that was the first time in my, all my Bigfoot research I'd ever had rocks thrown at me was at that location in that six week period. But that really, that, I've had a lot of rocks thrown at me since then. <laughs> yeah. What do you think the rock throwing means? Obviously they're being aggressive. Do you think they're trying to drive you out of the area? What was your take on that? Yeah, I think there's uh, multiple meanings. Like I said, when we first had those first couple of weekends, uh, I think it was the young ones that were playing with us and just teasing us or just getting our attention and and just seeing what we would, how we would react or what we would do. And then it may have been the adults came up and took over following that and became more aggressive because I think the adults are the, if they use rocks, it's for aggression. It's not for playfulness. And I think it had to be an adult that threw that massive boulder behind uh, David. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. When the rocks get bigger, I think it's bigger size Sasquatch. You know, when it's little ones, it's probably the juveniles. But when it turns the boulders, it's probably the adults. Yeah, I think that's that's my personal feeling. And that's several of us after discussing it several times. That's what we've kind of come to an agreement and a, a mutual thinking is yeah, the adults are aggressive and the juveniles are playful. They throw sticks, they throw little pebbles, they throw little medium-sized rocks, and they always just throw them like they angle throw them. They throw them at an arch and they don't try to take your head off. When these other ones come in to take your head off, or and we had one re uh, uh, researcher in 2010 in Dunbar, and I, I was almost hitting the head at this outing, this night outing, um, I can jump over there and talk about this. In July of 2010 in Dunbar to Game Lands, there had been a lot of activity from 2009 because I told about it last time of the, the two ladies, the sisters that owned that private uh, land that had the uh, encounter with the young one and the massive nine foot two one. Well, that got us started on researching Dunbar, the Game Lands and surrounding areas. And so there was a lot of activity, a lot of reports coming in from 09 to this time at July of 2010. So we, we about eight of us went up to Dunbar in this one location and we had been up there. Some of us, about four of us up there in the daylight and, uh, we were seeing, uh, structures, uh, twist stackings. We were in the woods having a pretty good, uh, having a good, uh, possibility of finding something, but, we didn't, we had split up. It was like two and two. We were staying in pairs and uh, the two of us that went one direction had nothing happen. But the two guys that went the other direction, they were uh, near a set of caves. Actually, uh, I'll talk about this in a few minutes called the Bone Cave. But uh, they were in the area near this place called the Bone Cave that we had not discovered yet. 
and uh, they're walking down this gully. It was a washout, and it was covered in pine in white pine trees. It was thickly, thickly vegetated with white pine trees. And uh, as they're uh, entering into this thicket, they heard what sounded like two uh, separate entities running on foot very quickly down the hillside, down the slope, out of their sight. And so that we knew there might be something there come nighttime when we were going to do a night investigation. So that was getting us excited. We're finding some structures. We're because I the one place across the street, and this is my own personal depict uh, thought about it. Some of the structures look like there was a training ground for the little ones. You'd see these big lattice work, uh, uh, like you like we used to use popsicle sticks and you stack and twist and put the sticks together. You'd find a big structure like that, and then off to the side you'd find a small one. Or you'd find a big arch and you'd find a small one. Or you'd find a, a stacking of uh, three or four limbs into the fork of a tree. And then you go a few feet over to the left or right, you'd find a small one. I said, this is like a, a, a training. This is like the school for Bigfoot. <laughs> I was making a joke and uh, the guys thought it was funny. So anyway, so that was our daytime activity. And at nighttime, we broke off into two different, well, actually three different groups. We had a group of people that couldn't really didn't have the physical ability to walk in the woods and, and do anything even after daylight or dark. So they stayed positioned closer to where we had a campfire and uh, uh, the cars were all parked up on a meadow. And then there was a group of us that had four people. And then there was another group that had five or six. I can't remember how many they actually had that went about 200, 300 yards down and away from us in the same direction where the earlier daylight running had occurred. And we're on radios. And about 10, 1030, I'm sitting on the top of a ledge, an outcrop rock. I got my, I'm just on the ground sitting there and uh, I'm back, my back's up against a very large tree. And I had a, another guy that was like in his early twenties. He's just a few steps behind me, leaning up against another tree that was just behind me, uh, the tree I'm leaning against. And then there was two guys off to the left of me with their head. They're, they're sitting on the top of this uh, ledge with their legs hanging over. And we knew down in the bottom where we're facing was all sloped away from us. And it, it was just cleared out. It was a great place for something to ambush deer. And so we had, we had examined that area in the daylight and got familiar with the terrain. And we're just sitting there in the dark. We didn't any of us have FLIR cameras in 2013 again. I'm sorry, in 2010, and uh, uh, I didn't get mine until 2011, and uh, so we're sitting there, and we're listening. Everything's normal, and we're on the radio with the other guys. They had done positioned themselves way down the hillside on the other, away from us, and the same thing. Nothing was happening with them, and it was almost like it was synchronized ambush. All of a sudden, a rock that was as big as the palm of my hand hit I mean, it had to have missed my head an inch or two, hit the tree that Robert was standing beside behind me, and it bounced off of that, and it scared him. I mean, he was, I think he was taking a nap standing there, and he jumped, and I'm ducking. I'm down on my belly almost because I knew my head I almost got nailed. Well, about that time, these guys are on the radio. Hey, guys, we're getting hit. We're getting rocks thrown at us. And, that, and, and one of the guys uh, uh, got hit. He got hit in the chest with a rock about the size of, a, of the palm of his hand. Ron got hit in the chest, but thankfully he had a uh, uh, a vest on, like a, a ski vest, a jacket with the, the lining, of the, the yeah, the pile lining in it. So it helped cushion. He didn't get hurt, but he said he felt it. And they're getting ambushed down there. And then here come another rock. It hits almost the same place above my head or where I would have been if I'd have stayed seated by the uh, tree. It hits that same tree. And we lit the, and all four of us sitting there and now standing, we lit that whole area up with flashlights and it stopped the rocks, but we never did see anything. Well, the other guys, the same thing, they're down there and they're, they're backing up and trying to get out of that area that they're in and rocks are coming pretty quick and forceful. I mean, super forceful. And we all gather back up at the meadow and we're like, what the heck, man? <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't have rocks like that thrown at us up at uh, uh, Clearfield. Why in the world? What in the world they they don't like this bunch don't like us here they they do not like us here so that got us all you know kind of <laughs> on on guard and we set up there in the meadow 
for another hour or two and nothing else happened once we got out of the immediate wooded area. But yeah, one of our guys, one of our guys got hit, uh, and I was glad he didn't get hurt, but, uh, that was in Dunbar in 2010 and, uh, that whole area, uh, I go back to, uh, that area real quick here. There was a place in 2011, the same location. I was there with an ex-girlfriend who had an interest in Bigfoot. She had heard me, uh, talking so much about my experiences and, uh, things that I was aware of in the uh, Bigfoot community that she wanted me to take her to one of my locations. Well, I thought, well, well let's go up here to where, <laughs> uh, I thought there was a training, you know, I, that's what we called it at that time was the training area. We always designated, give them all nicknames. So we kind of knew where each of these places were at when we had something happen. We, we kind of labeled them. I guess that's our kind of marker. We, we didn't put uh tree structures up to mark our air. We just gave it a nickname and then we would do the coordinates on a, on a uh, GPS or something. So other people could go and be at the same location if they wouldn't go in with us. So yeah, we were the same. We were just as guilty as Bigfoot. We marked our areas. So, uh, we went up to this, her and I went up to this location and we're up there in the daylight and it's a, uh, March, it was, uh, 2011. It was cold. It wasn't any snow on the ground, but we were walking all around and nothing, nothing too, too impressive, except she was seeing the structures and thought they were, you know, interesting. So we went over to the location where the two guys, Mark and Eric had heard the, the what they thought sound like two Bigfoot or two people running at high speed away from was behind this outcrop rock formation, a big hillside made out of rock and uh her and i are walking in this around this boulder this monster rock area and she spotted what looked like a cave she said is that a cave up there and i thought mm, maybe i said could be just an indention in the side of the rock but i said well, let's go up and see so we walk over and sure enough it's a it's a significant opening opening a cave and we stand there and i didn't have a weapon i didn't carry a weapon at that time and uh, we're standing uh, at the top of this. It was about a four foot diameter opening. And if you walk into it, just take one or two steps in, it immediately drops down significantly about 12, 15 feet, maybe further. And it's all jagged rocks and just a ledge, different little places to carefully. You almost, I had to crawl. You have to turn around back uh, and face the the, the, the area and back your way down, it's too steep to try to walk. And you climb down it. And then at the bottom of that is another opening, another cave. And it's, and what I could see, because I didn't know what I was looking at when I first found it, when she found it, and I was examining it, it opened up pretty significantly and it went back under the rock. And I said, she said, let's go down and see what's in there. What's going, what if, if it's another cave? And I thought, okay. And then I looked and I said, it, what I could see with my flashlight, it looked like there was bear feces, bear poop at the op at the face of this next level cave down below. I'm sure of what I was looking at. It, it, it looked like it. And what I've seen since then, and I know it looked like something, a bear or something large. <laughs> it was larger than coyote. I'll put it that way. It, whatever had left that in the opening of this cave area was bigger than coyote would have ever left. And I said, we're not going down there. I said, if there's a bear in that area, I don't have a gun and I cannot run up this slope <laughs> to get away from it. So we didn't go in there and I documented it. Two weeks later, she wasn't around here because that was somebody I knew from another state anyway. And I'm by myself. So I called some friends and I asked them if they wanted to join me up there. Let's examine this area. Told them what I'd found. They showed up and we went to this spot. Well, now we have a couple guys with some pistols on their hip. So we go to this location. We go down. We skinny down this slope of rocks. And it's a big opening down there. It's roughly about six foot square, maybe eight foot by six. And it's about three to four foot, depending on how the rock is. Is It's not completely uh, lateral across there. But it, uh, it was... Uh, at least a three to four foot opening ceiling height. And we get down to that opening and we were surprised inside of there was a full, a full doe, a doe, because there was no antlers in, in, in anywhere, but the skeletal remains of a doe was laying on the bed of this cave area. 
And I'm like, we're all like, what? <laughs> How does dough get down here? It, you know, unless a pack of coyotes would have drug it down there or a big bobcat or, or a bear or something had drug it down there, that deer would never have ended up in that location and died there for any reason. So we took all these bones and collected them and took them out and we positioned them on a, uh, a tarp that we had in our backpacks and we took pictures and we measured everything. It was, you know, we just documented everything. Then we walked around the area and we found another cave area in the back of the, of this rock, this outcrop rock. Uh, it was like a fracture. It's a big, maybe it starts about at the top of it. It's about six, seven feet high and it comes down and it's about a foot wide. Then it's like two and a half foot wide and there's a bulge in the rock. Then at the bottom, it's about three and a half foot wide. Well, it's too narrow for somebody my size to go back in there. And actually all of us were big guys, too big a guys to get in there. And the girl, that woman that was with us, she didn't want to go in this cave area. So we just said, okay, we'll come back some other time. Maybe we can get somebody, bring somebody with us that can make it in to this cave area if they want to go in and we can see what's in there. Well, I come back by myself when I didn't come back by myself. I came back with a, a friend, a coworker who had an interest in Bigfoot because he had heard some of my stories. and. Uh, he was a smaller guy than me. He wasn't really that much thinner, but he was a little bit smaller that he was able, he wanted, when we came in and went into the caves, the upper cave had another skeletal remains in it. That was the first significant thing. When we, Jeff was his name. When Jeff and I went in to the top opening and went back down to this four foot high area, there was another bone remains of another doe, which was weird. Two weeks, there were about two, I think it was three, three weeks had gone by and another deer has been drug in there and eaten or killed. And there's nothing, no hair, no fur, no anything but the bones. Like he had died in a uh, horizontal, you know, a prone position. And it's, it's just this bone matter. And we're like, okay, what's going on here? Well, we documented that. Then we went around this rock formation to the backside. And Jeff wanted to go in, but he couldn't get in. So he, he, I said, Jeff, don't get in there and get stuck because I don't want to have to try to get you out. I don't want to get an extraction team up here to try to get you out. I said, just do what you can. So he, he skinnies up in there as far as he can go, and he holds his – he had a camera, you know, a phone, cell phone with a camera, and uh, he's stretching his arm out in there as far as he can, and he's taking pictures, just mashing his you know, cut camera, taking as many random pictures as he can and doesn't have a clue what he's looking at. And he comes back out and uh, we start looking at his pictures and we're like, oh my God, look at all this bone. It looked like uh, three inches of bone matter, bone, broken bones on the, it looked like a horror movie. It was all these bones on the, on the floor of this cave. And then as he's taking the picture, we didn't see it with his, I take it back because it was the next time I was there with the next guy that went up there who actually went into the cave. But when Jeff took his pictures, we were already saying, okay, something, something has made a way to get in there. So we're figuring possibly a bobcat or a cougar, which we so supposedly don't have in what in Pennsylvania anymore. Uh, but something for a long time had been living and eating very well in this lower cave area. So we left and about three more weeks go by and I bring another guy named John and he's a young thin kid and big time loves Bigfoot and he's do anything you tell him to do. He'll go anywhere, climb anything. And we go back here to this location and he's going in and I said, all right, John, you get in there. You got to get out because <laughs> I can't come in with you at that time. I didn't know I could still, I could get in, but it was the next time I came up that I was able to do a commando crawl on my belly. And I went under this bulge and I was able to get up and come into the cave, but this time I couldn't. So John goes in there and he's got a camera and he's taking all these pictures and he's taking measurements. And, uh, the cave is about 20 feet long. It's about 10 or 12 feet high. And it's about four feet wide and there's these rock ledges in there. And he took, he, his camera was able to take uh, night vision, uh, uh, IR thermal, uh, vision camera, folk, uh, pictures. And he said, you guys are not going to believe you. Uh, he said, nobody's going to believe, uh, what I'm seeing. And, uh, was, we had a third guy with us, Greg, I forgot he was, was, but him and I did not go into the cave. John went in by himself and he said, you guys are not going to believe what I'm seeing in here. He said, this is crazy. 
So he comes out, and I'll send you these pictures, or I may have already sent them to you. But you, it's again, looks like a horror movie. There's all these skulls that probably are porcupine, raccoon, whatever small indigenous animals are in the Pennsylvania woodlands. There's all these skulls and bones up on the ledges around surrounding or going all the way around the circumference of this cave. And it's just bizarre. It's spooky. And he's in there taking pictures of it. And then he comes out and then we try to go around the whole area. there, finding to look for any other evidence tracks or anything. But only thing we found was some more of the uh, tree stackings and, that was the time when we found one of those. If you see that uh, cluster of uh, uh, images that I sent, the tree tree structures, the one that shows it looks like something twisted a tree around the other tree. It looks like it just pulled it around and bowed it around the tree trunk. That's when we found that. It was like something with an incredible hulking strength had just taken this 10-inch eight inch diameter tree and bowed it around another tree and then anchored it. So it wouldn't snap back. And I'm like, wow, you know, that that's, that's impressive, but we didn't have any more rocks thrown at us during the daylight and we didn't have any other situations happen, but that's the bone cave area. And I think that it, over time, it has uh, drawn a lot of attention by other researchers who I've sent up there. We position game cameras. I've positioned game cameras up there over two, three, four week periods. Other people have taken game cameras. So far, we have not been able to capture anything going into either the upper or the lower cave structure. And over the last, well, I investigate, continually investigated that area from the 20, 2009, 2010, up until 2016. And in that period from 10 to 16, we found two more bone structures of de of deer in that upper uh uh, uh yeah in the upper cave the four foot ceiling cave uh and we removed the bones each time so that we knew that it wasn't the same deer that we were seeing when we come back so we don't know what was drug dragging these uh uh deer in there but it was eating very good and we were not finding any kind of tracks or anything yeah that is unusual and it could be the Sasquatch seeking refuge in the caves when the weather gets nasty. And maybe that's what you're finding is their leftovers. That was a possibility we, we considered. You know, we don't like to say Bigfoot's everything, but there's always another option. I mean, we do have indigenous predators in Pennsylvania that could have done it. I mean, a pack of coyotes, I believe, could drag a full-grown deer into there. But uh there, I know bear and, and, and the, uh, there's creatures of opportunity. They're all opportunist and Bigfoot is as well. And I believe personally that Bigfoot will seek refuge in a cave structure when needed. I believe it, this one was not as isolated as some of the cave structures we have here in the abandoned mines that we have in Southwestern Pennsylvania that would provide ideal uh, uh, shelter for a, animal of that size and i can tell you this too because and i never got to i never got to meet this guy so i'm a little hesitant to give this but i believe the guy was legitimate the same location has a lower a lower area that is researched it's called the betty knox uh trail and there's a whole paranormal history with that <laughs> i won't get deep in that but anybody that wants to can just pull up betty knox uh haunted trail and get that detail but that's all part of the dunbar game lands that sits down low of where all this stuff was happening up on top of this mountain area anyway in uh, 2014 i was on facebook and this it was a it was a bigfoot uh group and this guy that lives in the uh, Dunbar area, he actually lives in Connellsville, which is a, the little township next to Dunbar. His name was Michael. That's all I know about him. He gets on there and he says, I, he was telling a terrifying story, or at least to him it was, that he, he and his family and his now him and his brother were trappers. They put traps out. And that kind of scared me because I don't want to step in a trap. I didn't know anyone was doing traps <laughs> on the game lands of Dunbar. And actually the game, 
the game management or the uh, uh, yeah, game commission, when I told them about this later, they said, well, we have no record of anyone putting game uh, traps out on that area, so we're going to have to do some investigating because it's a danger for people hiking. That you, you step in one of these things, you end up with a broken ankle. And he said they were uh, uh, putting traps out for fox, coyote, uh, any small animals that they could capture. And uh, this location that he was uh, posting on Facebook, and he asked, he said, anybody who wants to know more detail, contact me. And he gave, you know, his email address. So I contacted him and he gave me a very sincere story. He claimed that like two weeks earlier than what I had talked to him, he was going along. He hiked this Betty Knox trail at the, at the base of where the game lands that I do my investigating at. And he went back about a mile and a half, two miles into the woods. And this trail is like four or five miles long. And it goes into some very, very dense areas. And there's a, there's a double Creek that runs between two trails. So there's a water source there. And then there's a pond at the end of it that has fish in it. So there, and there's tons of wildlife all over this area. So it's a perfect area, perfect scenario for a Bigfoot for food and shelter and everything else. And I knew there was some cave systems in this particular area, but I had never been able to locate them. And he's telling me that he by himself had gone in to the woods to check some traps and put, put a couple new ones in out into the area where they trapped. And he said, he's walking along and not with anybody. So he's not making any noise. And he goes to this particular location and he, he gave me the rudimentary uh, location, but I kind of guessed where he was at, but I didn't know for sure. And I still to this moment don't know exactly where he was at, but he said, you leave the Betty Knox trail, you go to the left. There's another little slope, a, n- a little hillside, a little rise. You go over that and you come down and then there's another slope and you're going back in a, in a, in the easterly direction toward Ohio pile. And he said he had been in this spot, you know, since he was a kid with his dad and with his uh, brother and his uncle and, you know, different members of the family, they had traps that they had put out all over this area. And this particular time, he said it was just at day daylight. The sun was just coming up and he crossed that. He got up on the top of that second little, little rise And he saw movement to his left. He didn't even know this cave was there, he said. That's what he claimed. That didn't make sense to me that he had been there all his life, and he's like a 25- or 30-year-old guy, and he didn't know anything about this cave. But this cave is to his left, and as he's coming up to go over it, to go down this other slope, this Bigfoot crawls out of the cave, and it stands up. And he said this thing was gigantic. He said it had to be nine feet tall or more, jet black, massive built. And it's just standing there almost like it had just woken up. And he said it's sniffing. It's raising its back, raised you know, his head back and was sniffing the air. And he said, I'm laying down like I'm in, a, you know, I, I'm trying to be as flat to the ground as I can be. He said, I don't want it to see me. He said, I didn't want it to know I was there. So I said, well, what was happening? He said, I just laid there in, in scared fear. And he said, it just stood there and it, you know, sniffed the air everywhere. And he said he figured it didn't see him or recognize him being there because it turned opposite of where he was at and went down a little slope. And then it went up the other slope that he was directly headed to. And he said, as it, this is where, when he got up about middle ways, it stopped and did a 180 degree turnaround. And he said, he knows it was looking right at him. It detected him being there. And that's when he was terrified. And he said, I just laid there and then it turned back around and just kept walking till it went over that slope and out of sight. And he turned around and he took off back to the house. He said he got back to his car and left the woods and never, I don't know if he ever went back or not, but anyway, he told me this and I'm excited. I'm thinking, wow, would you take me t- to this location? I said, I want to, I'll go to it. If you'll just get me there, draw me a map, do whatever you got to do, but get me there. And he was telling me things that, you know, I could look for if I went there. Well, it was supposed to be two weeks that we were going to meet. I was supposed to meet him at the Walmart parking lot, pick him up. And then we were going to drive to this location together. And he was going to take me there. Well, I don't know what happened because he didn't show up. And when I called his number, his wife answered. She said, he doesn't want to do this anymore. He said, good luck to you. He's not coming out in the woods with you. He's sorry. Um, 
hope you don't have any problem. And I didn't, and he, he asked you, she said, he asked me not to call him anymore because he didn't want anything else to do with it. So I didn't get any, I didn't ever get to go with the guy, but I went and, you know, I went back out to that area several times, but I never did. We had encounter, we had reports come in after that, that people had seen movement or witnessed something that they thought was not a bear, but I never got to go to that cave. I'd give anything if I knew exactly where that cave was at. Yeah, that sounds like an interesting area. Maybe he ran into the creature and didn't want to go back. Something of that. I mean, I think it took more than him. Maybe he, I don't think he was that terrified when he said it turned around and saw him. Yeah, maybe he, maybe he went back and he had a, <laughs> had an, a, another second encounter and it was even more intense than the first one. I don't know, but his wife told me he wasn't willing to meet me and go in the woods with me. So. Unfortunately, I didn't ever have that opportunity, but that happened as the crow flies. That was exactly directly almost in line with where the group that got the rocks thrown out and Ron got hit in the chest. If you would have went straight up the side of the mountain, if that would have been possible because of the steepness and went all the way up on the top where we were all at that night in 2010, it was almost directly in line with the bone cave and, and, and where them, that bunch had been ambushed by rocks. So it all fits together, <laughs> but we don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, that is unusual. I'm going to give you a, a good one here, and this happened as a crow flies from this area about five miles. This was actually on, uh, I met Nikki, uh, so I investigated this area. This happened in 20, 2009. She, uh, she was actually uh, featured on the 2014 Finding Bigfoot as a witness that had a, a face-to-face with one of these things she uh at the time was working at a Nemecolon uh resort which was about 15 miles east of where the occurrence happened and she had to come through here when she worked as a bartender like 1 32 o'clock in the morning and she lived at the base of the mountain in a place called hopwood so she drove the same road to and from work every time she was going to work and in 2009 august of 09 She's coming through on Jamonville Road, which is near Jamonville Glen, which that has significance. That's the, uh, and I've examined this area. That's the Wooded National Park where George Washington, uh, his soldiers ambushed the French uh, scouting party that caused, started the uh, French and Indian War uh, in the 1700s. Well, that's what this significant is of this area is Jamonville Glen. And Jamonville Road, which has another name as well. The locals call it Cold Spring Road. She's driving down this road in her little Miata. This is what she told me as well as everybody she's told this report to. At 2 o'clock in the morning or thereabouts. And the road's a you know, mountain road. Hardtop paved road with uh, lines. It's a decent road. And she turned off of 40 off the main road back on the Jamonville Road. And she's heading to go over, she's only got another five miles to go down the mountain, the base of the mountain to be in her township. Her car lights see this thing. That's the way she said it. A thing was in the road. A large something was in the middle of the road ahead of her. And she slowed way down her car, way down, not knowing what it was, thinking that maybe it was a bear, but she could tell the color was a uh, cinnamon brown, dark brown. And uh, as she's easing and inching her way toward it and getting closer, getting closer, it stands up. It must have been crouched down for reasons we don't know. It was it stood up and it's massive. And it's just walking away from her down the center line of the road. And she has no idea what it is. Well, Nikki is from Sweden, I believe, is where she's from. And she said they had another name for Bigfoot in that country. And they really is more like folklore and legend than it was an actual research and belief. So she's easing. She had no idea. She hadn't lived in the location where this occurred at, but only a couple months. She had no idea about the long Bigfoot history going on in Fayette County and around this location uh, until her own, own encounter. And she drove up to this thing within feet of it. And it's still walking away from her, not looking back at her, not even paying her any attention. And she's, you know, and this little bitty Miata, and this thing is hulking above her 
massively. And so she said, I got to go home. I am not, what am I going to do? She said, she's thinking is all in her head, all in seconds. So she decides she's going to try to drive around this thing. And she slowly goes out into the oncoming lane and inches around. And when she got up to the side of it, le- it turned and looked at her and leaned over and looked her right in the face <laughs> through the windshield and scared her to death. Well, um, uh, I mean, that's a great report right there. She said she took off and she she still had to work. But then a couple months later, she ended up uh, with a job offer in Florida and she moved. She she left the mountain and moved out of Pennsylvania. And that's where she's still at, I guess, is down in Florida because she was in Florida in 2014 uh, when she came back up here to do her uh, feature segment on the uh, Finding Bigfoot show. But that particular road had another sighting of a by a man and his teenage son if you go past this area where she had her encounter and keep going to where it goes down the mountain on the other side of the top on the cold springs roadside to hopwood in the daylight a man and his son back in oh that was 2000 that was around the same time because we didn't learn about it till later but it happened around 2009 and uh in daylight they were going down the mountain and all of a sudden this black color looked like a chimpanzee is what they said came off the mountainside on their right jumped with double hands down just like a monkey it looked more like a monkey to them did a monkey jump across there hit the middle of the road and went over and down over the slope on the left and into the woods and out of sight and they said it looked like a big a big chimpanzee <laughs> so that's a that's an active area or it used to be but uh there's a there's a lot of this kind of stuff there's another one here uh a driver in a place called uniontown which is just sort of south of dunbar connellsville road 5 30 in the evening rush hour traffic in a congested location where you would never think a bigfoot now all this area is backed up to the to the chestnut ridge and actually by again all these things are connected it's like connect the dots here if you Look in the line of sight from where this occurrence happened on July 2009 in Uniontown. You're looking at the hillside, the mountain, where the man and his son had the chimpanzee thing. And if you keep looking, you're looking in the direction where Nikki had the monster in the road. A lady was coming home from her work uh, at 5.30ish in the evening on a busy one-lane road, but it's traffic in both directions. Sunshine, clear day. And she saw movement off to the left of her. Well, there's an elementary school, a middle school off to the left called Lafayette Elementary School. And uh, she saw something coming at a very fast uh, uh, speed running from the school in the direction of her car. And she was in traffic, so she couldn't drive too fast. And she thought it was a kid. She thought it was a teenage black kid. And she was a uh, African-American black lady. So she thought it was a young teenage black kid running in her direction when she first caught sight of this thing, creature running in her direction. And uh, she didn't know what the what was going on. Why was it running into traffic out into the street? And she, as it ran, it came up to the front of her car and up to her driver's window. And she said that's when she realized it wasn't a human being. It looked like a very thin ape like creature covered in sparse hand hair uh it had a, a a primate looking face but a human face at the same time and it was tall it was over six foot tall and it it come up and stood almost ran into this it did run into the side of her car and then it kind of rolled off the back side of her car and came across her trunk because whatever it did back there it had claws or something. It scratched. It left a gouge across the tr- uh, trunk of her car. And then it went into the side parking lot of the Rite Aid. And she last thing she saw is it was running as fast as anything she had ever seen run in her life down this road between houses. And it was headed in the direction of where that man and his son would have seen that chimpanzee thing running across the road. Uh, earlier in or yeah in 2009 at the time so there was something going on there but it, that one was crazy because that one ended up when we uh investigated that one that one actually made it onto the radio uh on the local one of the local fm stations here they had a uh uh 
time that they had paranormal and cryptid uh, m- minutes, like story time minutes. And we told that one and it was, you know, a lot of calls came in, but there was, that was a bizarre one there, but it all was happening in the same locate locality location. Yeah. It sounds like an active area and there's definitely a lot of activity happening in that spot. Oh, there is. I, I, at least there was, you know, in, in 29, 2009, 2010, up until it started tapering off around 2016. And, uh, at least as far as I know, 2016, 2017, everything started slowing down. And recently there's, uh, there's not been too many, the best one of 2016 and i'll stop it it'll be the last one here if you don't mind me giving you one more and this one's a very valid i i only investigated second hand stan gordon got this report in 2016 it's up on top of the mountain uh in the same vicinity except it's like five miles the other direction from all this other activity um and uh in fayette county and uh on in may of 2016 this couple was going down to a place called Fair Chance. They lived at the foot of the mountain, and they're going through Forbes uh, State Forest. And uh, they, uh, uh, it was about 9.30 at night, rain. And this is following the significant here. They had been a, a fire, a wildfire in Quebec run about two weeks earlier that had burned about 30 or 40 acres of land. And we don't know if that pushed these creatures out of their location. Cause again, Quebec run, that's where I had my orb experience. That's where several reports had come out of even the one when I had told you about the PA game of uh, uh, state constable had had his experience. All of this was within a, a mile, uh, you know, a couple years earlier of that location in 2016. So this couple's coming down this country road, this mountain road, 930 at night raining, And they said this creature was on the hillside to their left as they're driving down. It crossed in front of their car. It was massive. They said black or brown. They couldn't tell with their car lights. Crossed the road in one step, stopped on the right side of the road, and just stood there. As they passed by, they're looking at it, and they're like, wow, wow, wow. So they turned around. They got down the road a little distance. They had to find a good place to find to turn their car around. They wanted to see it. A couple wanted to go back and see if they see it better and they go back. So they turned around real quick and they come back up to that location. Well, they didn't, their car lights didn't pick up the one on the side of the road, but a second one that was still up on the right. Now it's on their right side on the hillside from the original one comes out into the middle of the road and it stops and they're coming up very slowly. They said, and it stops and it's facing them. It's, it's got a profile uh, position looking straight at them and they don't know what's, what it's going to do. And they keep easing, inching their car up toward it, thinking it's just going to turn and run at any second. And they're trying to get as close as they can to see if they can get a good look at it, which they did. And it didn't move. And they actually said, they swore that they hit their bumper. They felt the nose of their car bump it in the legs. And it leaned over and put both its hands on the hood of their car and stared right at them. And that scared them to death. And then it stood up and then it turned and went the same direction as the first one obviously was going and it disappeared. So we went up there several times over the you know, different months in 2016, but we couldn't find anything that supported that. But that was one of the best, <laughs> that was one of the best reports that we had gotten, you know, in a while. So that's, you know, I just wanted to share that with you. Otherwise I got a lot more like that to share but i think we'll just stop for now (laughs) i wanted to ask you i know that you're in communications with the small town monsters crew maybe you could put a bug in their ear and see if they wanted to come down and see some awesome areas active areas i mean if they're willing to you know keep it all private i'd definitely be up for that well, I will, and uh, I absolutely, I believe Eli and Alex- Alexander should definitely come do a, a a weekend, if nothing else, come to come to your area and do a weekend outing somewhere. Maybe meet you, even if the you know that's possible, because what you've shown me and what going down to Dave Dave's farm and all these other locations you've gone and shown. There's definitely something going on in Missouri and, and the Ozarks and, and everywhere. I mean, they they would benefit coming down there to do a, a documentary 
uh, in your location. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we'd be able to find some evidence for sure and have some activity. Um, I'm not sure if I know too many people that would want to do an interview that have already been on the show, but I definitely try to find some people. If not, I'd tell my stories, you know, on small town. And, and I think you should, I think you should. Well, I will definitely share that. I'll be, I, I, I'm friends with Eli, uh, and, uh, the producer, uh, he, uh, Heather, I'll, I'll contact them after we get off of here. I'll give them a shout and see what they say to me. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, I have saved every photo that you've sent over through email. So I think I got them all. And if you have anything else, just send it on over. I apologize for not responding to your last email. Everything's been down to the wire. And it's just like, as soon as I get done with one thing, I'd start another immediately. <laughs> that's that's perfectly okay. I understand that you're busy. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll look and see. I'll send you a couple more maybe uh, uh, that'll benefit, uh, support today's uh, interview. And you can post them as you please. You sent me over this photo of a structure and it kind of looks like a little tent like a little tent or a house or possibly like a small cabin what do you think the purpose behind that is because it seems too small for one of them to get into or you know to seek shelter in and i've seen the same thing in tennessee and in other areas well i wish i'd have had more time that i should have got in that was my first what i consider bigfoot structures that i found in a place called Pine Ridge State Park, which is at the tra- that's at the head of the Chestnut Ridge. It was pr- I thought was a I thought kids. I mean, when we were kids, we built forts and and my first thought when I finally stumbled a, 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 a pun it and found it is it may be some kids or some primitive uh, survivalist uh, campers had been in the woods, but this is in that portion of that was in the state park, and you're not allowed to camp overnight in that area and it was february and it was frigid weather at night nobody needed to be out in the woods camping if they were they would have been in actual camping tents they would not have been making make believe uh uh tents or something that looked like a tent like that um that one there to give you just something that gives some 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 clarity to what that one that was the size of a of a tent looked like an elongated uh pup tent or survival tent it was much longer than it looked because I thought the same thing when I first walked up on it. I'm walking it and it's well over six feet long. And I thought, wow, this thing's bigger than it looks. So I I had taken my coat and my backpack off and I skinnied into this thing and it was much bigger inside. It actually had another foot or two than I'm six foot plus tall. And I had more than enough ample room inside to turn and, and move around. And I, I didn't have any problem. When I came out of that thing, and was getting my coat and my backpack back on. It's, you know, pretty cold. It's like 30 degrees or more and uh, or less, I should say, because it was pretty cold. And all of a sudden, I start itching like somebody had poured itching powder on me, and I'm scratching, and I'm itching, and I'm like, what is going on? Well, I still to this day don't know for sure, but I think, this is my own assumption based on how it all became the way it did, I think there was a Bigfoot in that thing, and it had mites, the little parasites on its body because a deer has them, but deer would not have been inside of a structure like that. But I think I scared a Bigfoot out of that because it being 30 or 29 or whatever the temperature was at that time, mites don't survive off of the host, the mammal host, more than just a little short, a few minutes or so. They can't survive if they don't have a host. So they wouldn't have been living for an extended period of time inside that structure and I, the foolish me, climbs in there and they get on me. I become the new host. And I had to go home and take like two showers to get myself cleaned up and get all the itching. And I had little little red pimple bites all over me that I don't know what else it could have been but mites. And that structure was solid. That was a very well-made little structure. And whatever had been in there you and using it knew how to construct something, knew how to build something. Yeah, that's a good point. If you found mites in there, there had to have been something inside. Yep. I feel like it. And I, I but that was, and that was the time that I, I was, I think I told somebody, that wasn't you, I was, I'm actually going to a, uh, uh, an event this weekend and I was telling another researcher who I'm going to meet there, the story about that by coincidence. And when I came out of that 
structure and I'm itching and I'm cold and I'm putting my coat on and I'm trying to get situated. That's the first time that I ever had this feeling of dread that something's watching me and it doesn't want me there. And I'm, I'm doing a 360 scour of the hillside and the surrounding woods and I couldn't see anything, but I was getting out of there anyway because of the itching. But that was my only time in, that was in 2000. And, um, uh, and I'm sorry, 2001, February of 2001. And that and the other time that I said I was standing in the rhododendrons in 2015 are the only time I've ever had that feeling of dread. And I have been miles in the woods before and after that and never felt that kind of tension that, that, that uh, I need to go. I need to go now feeling, but that was it there. I think I, I think I did. I think I, I scared a, a full grown Bigfoot out of that structure. Yeah, yeah, it's very possible. And I interviewed a guy named Dale from Tennessee who found those same exact structures in a wildlife management area in the Cumberland um, Plateau. And it's identical to what you showed me. And he had some really big ones there, some X's, and they were all found in the same place down in, I think it was like a river bottom with the big rock bluff and caves around it. You know, people shouldn't be in their building structures. Well, I talked to the park ranger a couple weeks after that and told him what I had seen. And he said, yeah, there's no one allowed, no overnight campers, no primitive campers. He said, I'll go back and check the area to see what's going on because I checked it very closely. There was no footprints, no cigarette butts, no paper or cellophane or chewing gum or nothing. No sign of humans or anything in that area. And the park ranger said, yeah, if we would have found someone in there, they would have been removed immediately. And if they were doing anything, they shouldn't have been. And no guns are allowed on that state park. So it wasn't a hunter because he said, if we'd have found anyone hunting, it's a $300 fine. And we would have uh, taken action on that. So he said, yeah, I don't know what you found, but it shouldn't be anybody staying overnight in this park like that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's definitely people doing it, but hairy people. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes, it was. That's what I believe in. So that was, that was that. And they, that was, I've never, I've never found exactly that kind of structure. I found one that was like, I think it was old, uh, back in 2018, I was in a place called South park. There had been a family that had a, a birthday party. South park is a kind of a, it's a, it's a, it's a commercial type park, uh, setting. It has some very rugged rural areas attached to it, but Families come in there for picnics, and and they were doing a birthday party, and they encountered one that we later, in, uh, when we investigated it and measured it, the head of this thing touched a limb that was 11 foot 2 inches tall from the ground. And when I went back into the woods where this occurrence happened and investigated as much area as I could find, I found one of those structures but it was deteriorated. It was uh, limbs had already collapsed. They'd done dried out, but it was made just like the one I crawled in in uh, 2001. And maybe that's what it was being used for years before, you know, it was there now. Yeah, absolutely. It's a shame you don't find everything in just one spot. It seems to be cluttered around the forest and you really have to look through everything sometimes even miles and miles just to find a few things here a few things there and then you put it you add it all together exactly and that's why i call it like finding easter eggs or <laughs> it's like you're you're doing a scavenger uh the bigfoot scavenger hunt and you you got to go miles instead of you know around the yard you got to go miles to find all their little their little uh things that they've left you as uh calling cards to, uh, that they have for themselves i guess but yeah, yeah it's, it's difficult i wish we we got places or we have had places and they're still there that seem to be more populated evidence found in a, in an isolated area but generally yeah you've got to walk miles in the woods to find just one or two items yeah and um real quick before we end the show have you ever found any x structures um next to populated areas like popular trails or parking lots anything like that not x's x's are generally in a, in a in a remote area it's that's the one shape that we don't find we find the bows the arches or whatever uh next to road 
roads. Uh, we find the teepees, the leaning stick or tree structures up into the fork of standing trees. We found those next to roads or uh, near a housing plan in the woods just above them. But the X usually is typically out, and for me it has been, is always out in the deeper woods. Yeah. And do you find it on the high ground or lower ground? I say about, it's about even. I mean, I haven't even noticed it. it's probably, it's all on the elevated, uh, or, yeah, typical average ground. It's not down in the bottom or anything. It's usually on whatever the best elevated ground is. Uh, it's not any special height in the elevation where I find them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, after listening to your story in the first interview, I wanted to mention that the orb that you guys seen, I, I think that's Bigfoot just because with my personal experiences and having Bigfoot activity, I've seen orbs associated with Bigfoot activity, and right. they go hand in hand, I think. A lot of people say that, and I mean, that was what we were there for. We had that report that had been given to us by a farmer and we couldn't get on his property because he, he, he was scared to death and he didn't want the thing there. He kept asking, he was the guy, Greg was the guy that knew him personally. He was told about this farmer having seen the creature and it was, he had, he was a deer hunter and he had a baited area down there and this creature was coming up to the baited area and he's seen it. And he said it was bothering his deer. It was really upsetting this guy, but he wouldn't let, he thought at first he was going to let us come on his property and go search his property. Then he changed his mind. And so we still wanted to see if we could get activity with that, that one creature he had been seeing. So the best we could do was like a mile away, which was Quebec run. And that's why me and Eric were in that particular area which borders west virginia preston county and this guy wasn't more than a mile away his farm was no more than a mile away from where we were in the quebec run and that's where we saw the uh, orange orb at but that's why we were there we were there hoping for bigfoot to show up and do something <laughs> yeah yeah it's a twilight zone you never know what you're going to experience deep in the brush out there that's a perfect analogy. Uh, exactly what we deal with is a twi- is a real life twilight zone. Mm-hmm. Have you ever talked to anybody that mentioned like Sasquatch just disappearing out of the blue or going into a portal? Anyone that seemed like legit? Well, I know about a I know about a couple, and one for sure that Stan Gordon got a report of, and I know the location very well. Did it happen? Let's see, we're in twenty three twenty twenty three now. Uh, so it would have been three years ago in 2019, there's a, uh, uh, turnpike, uh, S- route 66 over here that runs between Delmont and Greensburg, uh, that where this incident occurred at, uh, roughly around nine o'clock at night, it would have been in the summer. So it was after nine cause it was dark. And this guy who reported it, him and another driver were it's two, you know, two lanes, two lanes, two coming one direction and two going the other way. But the roads are separated by a massive amount of dirt and hill. It's rugged in between the two lanes going in both directions. So at this particular junction, anyone going south would not have seen anything going across, oh, go, happening over on the northbound side where this occurrence happened at. These two guys, and I know this road very well. I've traveled it many, many, many times, day and night. Uh, they were driving back into Delmont region, the north north uh, bound lanes, sort of together, and that's 70 mile an hour traffic uh, uh, speed there. And as they're approaching this location, they told Stan, they said they saw this creature. They didn't know what it was at first. The guy said, I saw this massive black, dark hair colored creature and it's coming out, and he knew it was going to cross the road ahead of him. So they both must have been thinking the same thing because they slowed down side by side on this turnpike. This creature comes out, but what's different as he comes out, they realize from the waist down they can't see it. It's, it's nothing there. It's just like just from the waist up that they can see it. <laughs> and it comes across and goes into the up on this little medium in the middle where this hillside is goes up it and over it and out of sight. Now, if somebody on the other side saw it, no one ever called Stan or reported it to anywhere that it made it to the, uh, to the media or to the public to know about. But both of these guys 
got out and talking to each other and they both exchanged phone numbers and names and everything. And they both contacted Stan and it, it, that's a bizarre, <laughs> it's a bizarre, uh, statement that, you know, all they saw was from the waist up, waist up of a Bigfoot. <laughs> yeah, that is unusual. And have you ever heard of the Jotuns or the Jinn in ancient mythology? I've heard of the Jinn, yes. Yeah, well, the descriptions of those beings or supernatural beings is very similar to the Sasquatch. They'll visit cemeteries. Um, they can go invisible. And just like the description of the creature itself on how it looks like, you know, is pretty darn similar. So I wonder if this is the same phenomenon that's happening all around the world, because it sounds like the same types of stories. You know, that's what some of us say here when we're talking amongst ourselves is misidentification or maybe it's another creature altogether and not, and, and Bigfoot's getting a bad rep <laughs> and it's something like you say, a gin at some other culture, some other uh, group of people are seeing something. They're not calling it a Bigfoot. They're calling it whatever they call it, a gin or whatever their culture calls it. And it's all the same thing. Maybe it is. Maybe it's all Bigfoot. Maybe that's why I say about dog man, people suddenly jumped on the dog man wagon about eight years ago. And I think it's misidentification. Because I've been in the woods too many times in too many years, and there was no dogman conversation going on with anyone. There was no, the only thing I knew about was the lizard man down south in the Carolinas, and that was in Bishopville. And I went down to somebody's farm at that location, and I examined that river shoreline. I walked every place I could find to walk. I saw nothing. I thought it was a joke. Now, there's people that swear <laughs> that there's a giant man-sized lizard walking in Bishopville, South Carolina, but I never saw anything, but you know, I, I, it, I'm thinking maybe it was something besides, a, you know, I don't know how you would get a lizard mixed up with Bigfoot, but unless he had the mange and they thought it was something besides a primate looking creature. But, uh, yeah, I think a lot of times fear makes a lot of people see things differently than what it really is. And they, they get confused, but then, yeah, they, they call it a different thing than what we call it. We call it Bigfoot, and we're all talking about Bigfoot, and they're talking about something else, but we're talking about the same creature, the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think people definitely um, misidentify things and have a bad way of, um, how do I say, analyzing things. <laughs> but um, yeah. I, I do believe Dogman is real and that there are legitimate encounters. But yeah, with my personal experiences, I don't run into too many people that have Bigfoot and Dogman. That's pretty rare. And I, I hate to say it, but a lot of people that, you know, talk about Dogman, to me personally, they send me these photos that are like super blurry. You can't see anything. So it, it's really hard to say, you know. Well, that's the sad thing with our research. It really sets our research back. And I I respect people want to see things or believe they saw something, but they're not seeing, and it's pareidolia and their shadows. I know this because I've seen it too. And that's why with the caves, when you're walking through the woods, shadows are horrid. I mean, they're, they're, they'll give you images that are not there and your mm -hmm. mind convince you that you're looking at something that isn't there and, and, I'm the guy that goes over and looks, though. So I'm not going to take a picture and go home and say, you know, I bet that's Bigfoot or I bet that's Dog Man. I go to that location. I guess one of these days I'm going to get broken into pieces or eaten because I don't know it better than to go over and check it out. And then I'm laughing and I'm like, no, nope, just a shadow. No, nope, just a tree stump. I'm the guy. That's what gets me upset when I get these pictures all posted online and I see all these people that are, I mean, they are hard believers <laughs> that they took a picture of a big butt. And I, the first thing I say, did you go back to that area and go to that location to the location, not across the field, looking at it and put your hands on that spot? Oh no, no, no. I'm not going to the woods. I'm not going. I said, then it's not a big butt. I said, if you can't go up close and tell me that spot still that not there and it was there, then we're not going to talk about it. And people get so upset with me being a diehard veteran field researcher to, to, you know, confirm that they saw Bigfoot and it was a Bigfoot. And I'm not saying they didn't, but when they don't do the examination investigation correctly, then it's just hypothetical. You can't swear that it was a Bigfoot. Shadows will definitely play with your mind. Absolutely. Especially with cameras 
and lighting. And it just seems like people are so quick to say, oh, that's Bigfoot or this is what this is when they weren't even there. You know, sometimes, you know, it's a trail camera or they just snap a photo with their cell phone and go back home and say, yep, there was two of them right there. And I never even saw them. Oh, that's exactly right. So, I mean, all of these I'm talking about here is people actually saw something physical. There was one here. I was looking here to tell you if we were going to talk anymore. Was, there was one that caused a wreck uh, in Derry Township, but this was down on Derry Township Main Road 2017 and 2016. And the reason I know firsthand information from it is one of the researcher's sister and brother-in-law are, are licensed paramedics, and they were on call this night, and they heard the police call, the fire and ambulance call over the radio, and there was three cars that had crashed into each other, dodging this animal that crossed the road in between them in the rain, in the dark. And when they investigate, when the police and everybody got there, the cars were crashed and wrecked. The creature's gone. It did, It got through, and they all said it was something on two legs, tall and hairy. One thought it was a bear, but the other two said, I don't know what it was. It came off the hillside, which would have been the Chestnut Ridge, Dairy Ridge side of the road, leaped into the road, and then crossed the road and went down the side of a farm, a fence that had a house and a barn, and disappeared into the woods out, and it was so dark and raining, no one could see it. But the police and everybody on there is talking about this bear but it was a bear on two legs running <laughs> that caused a wreck. And all these people saw it. So later, I called my one guy that I know uh, uh, that's a game commission officer, and I, I talked to him, and I said, did you guys get a report? He said, yeah, we actually we did because it involved an animal. He said, but we don't know what it was, and it certainly wasn't a bear. And I said, okay, <laughs> that's all I want to hear. It wasn't a bear. He said, no, there was no way it was a bear, but something – you know, and again, this kind of stuff happens all the time and you don't hear about it on the news or the main um, in the news or the main TV uh, or nothing. No one else has ever heard about it unless they heard it through us. They, they hit it because they don't really know what to say about it. <laughs> yeah, it seems like Bigfoot incidents with the law ends up being a bear every time. Yep. That just goes to show that they can tell people anything and they're going to believe it. And that's just how it works. And then, well, it, it gets forgotten about very quickly. If it's a bear, oh, well, everybody's seen a bear, knows a bear can be on the side of the road. And it can cause a wreck and it can attack somebody or cause damage. So, okay, well, that's just, you know, that's just normal behavior. If you say Bigfoot, though, <laughs> it's going to be thought about for a long time and a lot of questions asked. Yeah, absolutely. So, All this stuff is happening right underneath our noses. It absolutely is. Because, I mean, I'm, I get frustrated about that because we we tried, a couple of our guys did in the Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society, tried to go door to door in the Dairy uh, Ridge area, in the Dunbar area, where all this heavy activity is happening, knocking on doors, leaving flyers, and we got the police called on us. <laughs> we, they're telling it, you know, police are saying, no, that's harassment. No, that's uh, trespassing. You, we do not need to be, do not let us be called anymore about your group. Uh, having him for uh, in, trying to in, interact with the community, we do not need to hear about that. So we got in, we got in trouble, and the people wouldn't would you know they wouldn't want to, they wouldn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to tell us about it, and and we're like, well, there's a reason we can't get any further with our research and our investigations, and no one, you know, you find one person out of ten that'll talk about it and ask questions, then the other ten laugh at you and tell you we're not talking about that. Or I don't have anything to say. You guys don't don't be on my property. So we can't we can't make our research improve our research uh, any better because uh, people won't nobody wants to work along with us. I wanted to give you a real quick thing here for the uh, I'll send you this link uh, if you want to find out some of these uh, occurrences that I'm sort of giving the highlighted uh, version of. You can go to our uh, web page. The Keystone Bigfoot Project. It's the old Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society webpage. And I'll tell you on there, I don't know how much you can put on there, but it's a recent added sightings report. And pretty much like the lady in Uniontown with the one that rolled across her car. And, and uh, some of these others are on there. Somebody actually populated, uh, updated the uh, website. 
uh, with those accounts. So somebody who wants to read a little more detail, they can uh, go onto that website. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad to hear that, you know, you look through the reports and, you know, you investigate on all the serious ones. I can't tell you how many, you know, actual researchers I've bumped into, you know, that tell me all these stories, you know, there's two aliens holding hands with a Bigfoot walking right next to them. And, you know, they just keep going and going that they investigate all these places. But when you find out like their take on it, you know, they're showing you all this pareidolia and just weird stuff. So they have like a really bad way of analyzing reports. But with you, I can tell that you were investigating genuine honest people and not only that you were hitting up active areas with reported sightings year after year i am i'm a genuine guy i call i said this the last time i'm a realist i don't have time to waste and i'm i don't really i'm not there to <laughs> pamper anybody or make them feel good i'm there to do my research and if their research is not embed not bettering my personal research, if their witnesses and evidence reports are not uh, helping me, I will stop in a minute and say, you know, I have a good day. I'm not here yeah. for this. I yeah. won't waste my time. And I certainly will not embellish a bad report. Or if I had any doubts with it, you and I won't even talk about it because I'm not going to waste your time if I'm not wasting my own time. Yeah, absolutely. Have you ever ran into any researchers that were like that or maybe try to like steal your areas? Not really steal them, but, you know, just yeah. kind of. Yeah, leech off you. <laughs> I, know, I know about three of them personally that used to be what I considered to be friends. And they were the kind of people that won't go into woods themselves. They're actually afraid to, and they are lazy. I don't know what the real purposes are, but they'll they'll get up in front of a group of people. And I was witness to it. And I had other people come to me and say, Dwayne, some, this guy was telling your, a story that I know you had encountered with. And I'm like, really? And sure enough, they were telling the, the report as if it was their report, as if they were there, as if that was something happened to me that happened to them. And I confronted them. I mean, I really got upset and we stopped being friends. And I told them, I said, don't lie. I said, I will not accept any part of a lie. Uh, and mm -hmm. if you want to if you want to go with me and you want to be part of this, that's perfectly OK. You can build your stories with me when I build mine and they happen to me. You'll happen to you. But you are not going to take my story and act like it belongs to you. And I know three people that were doing that. And it's really tore us apart up here in Pennsylvania as a as a Bigfoot research society. We, we don't mm -hmm. trust each other anymore. Yeah, that's the hardest part is trusting everybody. Um, I've worked with the researcher before. He knows everything about Bigfoot. He'll tell you what you found isn't Bigfoot. No, that's not Bigfoot. That's not Bigfoot. But when the Sasquatch come out, he's the first person to go to bed at 9 o'clock, 9.30. It's like, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I know these people as many years as I've been in it, many people as I've interacted with. Yeah, there's some that are just a joke. They're a joke. They they've got they want that five minutes of, of fame. They wanna they want to get the spotlight on them and they don't care who's how they do it. They don't care what they have to tell and how they who they tell it to. And they do it in a way that we some of us caught one of a guy. We were at a, an event, he was a speaker, and we already silently off to the side by ourselves we all knew this one particular report had been already discarded we knew it was a not a believable report and we had all agreed amongst us that we're not going to follow up on it we're not even going to talk about it it doesn't mean anything this guy got up in front of like 400 people and he's telling this story as if he had gone and met the guy and investigated it. And we're looking at each other. The rest of us are all rolling our eyes like, what is he talking about? And after it was over, we said, why did you talk about that? He said, we didn't have anything else to talk about. So I used that. But he had lied on the whole. I said, that's why we're not going to have anybody wanting to believe us anymore, because you are telling lies. Yeah, yeah. I had a researcher that was saying everything was a track, and I found this impression. It kind of looked like a track, could have been a boot track or just like a lawnmower cut, you know, in the grass. But like he like really embellished it, said it was a Bigfoot track, like dug it out with his hands, took out the needles, the leaves, and then casted it. And after he did that, it had the shape of a cast. But me and the rest of the guys, we were kind of shaking our head, looking at it like, no, dude, you can't. If you have to take out leaves, all the rocks, dig it out with your hand, you have done messed up whatever was there. You're adding to it. You know what I mean? I don't like people doing that, embellishing lies. Yeah. 
you've distorted the real image and it's not factual anymore. So you're not doing anything. That's why I don't even do the casting because it's just a waste of time and money of uh, material that doesn't usually hold up. So I take powder and if it looks like I have to get down on my hands and knees, I mean, I get right down on it and I look at it and I measure it. And if I can see the distinctive clarity of a, of a foot and toes, I'll put the powder in it with a, I got a powder, a sniffer bottle that I use for uh gold mining when I used to do panning and stuff in the creeks and I put powder in there and I do it and do an outline, a trace outline of the image. And then I fill that image with powder. And that looks just like what I'm seeing with my eye because you can't see that clarity detail when you take a picture, no matter how you do it, it won't show up on a film image the way it does when you're looking at it with natural eye. And so I put the powder in there, but then I got guys that do what you're talking about. They, they've gone along with me and they want to, they want to make it more distinguished, put a, you know, press their hand a little bit. It's not so good right here. So I said, you don't touch us. You do not touch a track. <laughs> mm-hmm. I said, you just changed the whole image of that track when you put your hand on it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, here's another one. Have you ever had a researcher tear down the structures or pull them out? Oh man, that really grinds my gears uh yeah i'll have to i have to confess i did that i just i did it when i told you that and it was before it was when i was just starting the you know before i even really knew about the structures but i after i talked to mary green and she's starting to tell me to look for these structures and i'm like learning about what a structure is and where it is the day that i found those primitive looking tent thing at one in the, the, the lean to as I'm going up that he- up a hill, it's a trail uh, that I had walked many times in that last several months. I had been there on a Sunday, and I walked up there with no impediments, no problems. Everything's just normal as ever, and I had nothing. I didn't find anything. Didn't find the structures. Didn't find any. I found a stacking. I will say that I found what looked like average was three to four inch round logs tree branches that were about four foot long stacked symmetrically around a tree at the top of the hill that was all i found on the sunday the day i was there on tuesday because i was between contracts so i had a lot more time that was when i came back into the woods same woods and that's before i before i found these uh primitive structures that we talked about a minute ago i'm going up this main little trail it's it's a hiking trail. It's not a deer trail. It's not a walking trail. And I don't know who put it, who cleared it, but it was a regular hiking trail. And it's pretty steep uh, that you have to go up about a hundred and something yards to get up to a level where it kind of uh, levels off. And for whatever reason, something had taken all these trees that were all the same about inch, inch and a half, two inch diameter and bowed them over and twisted them together across my trail and then stuck all these same size branches in there. It looked like a, like a giant dream catcher and it's blocking my trail that I had been hiking up many, many times. And I'm standing there and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, what, who, who thinks this is funny? Why are they blocking my trail? So I just, I ripped it apart. I tore it all apart. And then I continued into the woods and I was up there, you know, another hour, two hours of hiking. And then I come down and found those structures. And like I said, then I had this dread feeling and I'm wondering if I upset it <laughs> all was connected back to that, but I didn't want to think that way. I'm thinking, well, I crawled in and I pushed it out of its structure. It's mad at me. If it's here, it's mad at me for that reason. But I had torn down its little barricade that it pushed and it built across the trail that I hiked up. I, I, I did that that time. And that was the only time I ever did it. Yeah, that's not so bad. I've done that before. I just mean like their structure areas, like where you find all the X's and everything together. I've had people, you know, I'm showing them and they'll just like go push it down. It's like, why would you uh, do that? No, I haven't. <laughs> luckily I haven't been with anybody like it. I'm sure there are, cause there's people who will destroy anything if they can yeah yeah i think people do that on purpose no i was just wondering you know i was curious i i have bad run-ins with people people that try to pull things lie and you know just extend the truth and i didn't know if that was just me or or if that happens everywhere but it makes it better for when you actually find legitimate good people because you know they're telling the truth you can hear the fear in their voice the details in their story and the way they're always honest well, I agree with you, and I'm I'm pretty good at judging characters too. And I'm 
I've been around enough people that I know were not truthful, not factual. So, yeah, it, it's something you can learn to tell those traits in people if you're around enough people. But, uh, yeah, I've been lucky. No one I've been with. I know I've been with people that were willing to shoot one of these things, and that makes me angry. I mean, I carry a gun on my hip, but it ain't. it's not to shoot Bigfoot. It's to, I mean, well, if one was crazy and was coming at me to tear me into pieces, I would definitely empty my gun into it for that reason. I'm going to live if I can, but I'm not out there with the intention of harming any animal in the woods. But I carry a gun because twice I've had encounters with coyote, one that I was stalked out of the woods over a mile uh, in the dark <laughs> by myself in 2010. And the other time was with a friend in 2016. We got surrounded by a pack of coyotes in the dark. And that's a very uncomfortable feeling. Well, I've had guns because of that. I do not want to be a victim to a pack of coyotes. <laughs> but Yeah, uh, I've had them stalk me before, too. And it's pretty scary. It yeah, I'm not afraid of much, but that that got my hair standing up on my on my neck and my arms, thinking I'm gonna rip, I'm gonna get ripped to pieces here. These things have intention to harm me. <laughs> yeah, when they um, stalk me, they triangulate like they triangulated around me, and I climbed up a tree like a black bear. It worked. It scared wow. them. Wow, that's a great idea. I wasn't near any trees, unfortunately, at, at either occurrence, and. I, they could have gotten me if they'd have wanted to, but it, it taught me a lesson to start carrying a weapon in the in the woods when I go now. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely carry a weapon because there's crazy people, there's predators and cryptids. You never know what you're going to run into, and sometimes they might be hostile. You never know, and you know, I've had people say that to me about Dunbar and up in Fayette County is we we – me and another two guys were out bigfooting and we come down this isolated road and there was these three guys walking the other direction and we're like, where'd they come from? And the one had a machete in his hand. <laughs> we're like, uh, what's going on here? They were nice. They were friendly guys. And we tried to keep it as cordial as we could and brief as we could. We all had pistols on our hips, but I'm thinking if I was by myself and I come up out of the woods and didn't have my gun and I meet guys with a machete. I don't want to, I just don't want to be in that situation. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of times people are nice. If you got a gun, you know what I mean? If you're a little kid, it may have gone differently. You know what I mean? I, I, has, I hate to think so, but you're right. It could have been a different ending if, uh, been a you know, situation was any different, but, uh, I, I just get upset when people say, yeah, we need to yeah, we can get a, find a Bigfoot. You need to show us where they're at so we can get one and kill it and study it. And I'm like, no, we're not killing anything. <laughs> not not because of me, you're not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't like it when, like, I show people a research area and they start bringing people that I don't know out there. You know, it's cool if, like, they tell me, they call me, hey, I'm going out there, I'll let you know what I find. But, like, when they start, like, not including you in your own area that you showed them and bringing, like, foreign people out there, I don't like that. So I started keeping things private. You know, it's it's a dangerous world in, in the Bigfoot community. <laughs> it, it, it really is, and we do some of the same thing here. And I'm, a lot, some people – keep the reports i mean really close at hand they don't share anything stan gordon's one of them staying i've known stan he's a good guy he's a friend uh he has a lot of knowledge a lot of experience but he won't give you any any real detail uh down to a location he'll give you something that you're within a hundred maybe a mile you're on the right road or you're, you know, the next woods over from a farm or something, but he will never tell you anything. And I've met some of his witnesses by chance at events who would tell me the story that I happen to know because Stan had told some of it. And when I'd say, well, I would have loved to have come to your farm and, uh, and investigate. And they say, Oh, you're welcome anytime. And I said, well, Stan said you didn't want anybody there. And so over the years, we all got a little upset because he's got hundreds of reports of, uh, that he gets called into his website, his phone, his eight his his phone number. And we don't get anything, but just, you know, kind of throws us a crumb and tells us he's getting reports in a particular area, but we don't get any details. And there's a lot of people like that that want to keep those reports for themselves. They don't want to share them with the rest of us who they know we're 
legitimate researchers. We're honest people. We're not going to uh, eliminate them in the research and the evidence. If any's found, we're not going to sh- you know shut them out. And yet we don't get any. So that really hinders. It sets us back as researchers because we don't get those reports handed to us. Uh, I, I have to dig hard to find out when something uh, has occurred in this area. Uh, and if you were to go ahead, I know somebody, one of your commenters or two of them suggest that you contact Stan. He's a wonderful, uh, knowledgeable orator and a knowledgeable guy in this industry. And I think the, uh, the, the world of him, uh, as a, as a person, but he won't tell you any more than he'll tell me. It'll all be very generalized information. He'll never tell you exact locations or any names he'll never he'll never give you a name of a of a of a of a witness or their location of how they saw it it'll always be very general so when you got people that's doing like that the rest of us (laughs) we struggle we have a tough time we don't get the luxury of going to all the sightings and stuff because somebody's not wanting to share the information with us so that's why i feel like in my 20 plus years that i've been actively researching i'm just scratching the surface because i you know people don't know me i kind of stayed in the shadows for a very long time i didn't want to be bothered by people and i would just go out whenever somebody shared information with me or i was out there on my own just (laughs) uh hoping like a blind squirrel i find a nut but uh I, uh, you know, I probably would have been in way much more involved in this and more people would have recognized who I am by now if I'd have done like Stan and other people have and been more prominent and more active uh, in the media side of it. But I, I always stayed in the back. I didn't want to be bothered. But I, after a while, I said, you know what? People are using my research <laughs> and they're campaigning off of my research. They're building their reputation off of my research. I need to stop that. It's my turn. I'll take credit myself. <laughs> yeah, that's the best way to go. And I keep a, a lot of my places private just because, you know, people going in there with guns, driving them out of the area and, um, just having the wrong people in there in general. Well, that happens. That happens. You let too many people know about something and the wrong somewhere the wrong person will come in and mess it up for you and everyone else. Yeah, absolutely. And they say like trail cameras, you know, really messes with the Sasquatch. They don't like it and too much human presence. You know, I think it's all right, you know, one to three people. But when it's a lot of people going in there and a lot of different faces, I think they they tend to move on. That, yeah, you you can you can push them out, push them away. Uh, Two thousand five, we had a conference. Uh, the PBS did the Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society, and the late Bill Draginis, uh was one of our featured speakers. He was from uh, Virginia, and he came up and he worked his career work. It was intelligence and surveillance uh, electronics for the FBI, the CIA. Anybody who was government uh, connected, and he was a super, super nice guy and a super, super smart guy. And he had all these electronic gadgets like ohm meters, uh, uh, oscilloscopes, and and all these digital meters that monitored uh, uh, frequencies and and wavelengths and everything. And he set up this demonstration that he carried with him on the road when he went to these places to talk. And he demonstrated to us what a game camera at the time in 2005, what they were, and they emitted a signal. Uh, Any of the Nikon, Sony's, any of the digital cameras that all of us were carrying into the woods at that time, each one of them was emitting a signal. And he showed us how strong the signal was. He said, if these animals, these Bigfoot or these creatures can, can, can detect the same ultrasonic, the same digital, whatever it is, signal that I'm picking up on these meters, then it's, you're never going to spot one with your cameras. You're never going to pick one up on your, uh, uh, game camera. So we all quit turning our cameras on again. This was just before cell phones and cameras on cell phones became popular. So we were all carrying digital cameras. So we all would take our cameras and turn them off when we went into the woods, just hoping that would not uh, give the heads up to the Bigfoot that were there. And, um, but he was the first, he was the guy that, uh, 
opened our eyes, exposed us and let us know, but he passed away a couple, uh, yeah, he passed away from cancer in 2018, but he was a, uh, a super smart guy. And that, that was, that was a great thing that he showed us. So even though I've had digital cameras in the woods, I never got a Bigfoot. I mean, I've gotten bear, I've gotten coyote, I've gotten numerous deer, skunks, you name it. If it's in the woods, I pretty well picked it up on my game cameras. Now, I had an incident that was still freaky bizarre to me to this day. I was in Fayette County up near uh, in Forbes State Forest in 2015, where I've had all these other occurrences happening off of Pine Ridge Road. Uh, I'm sorry, Pine Knob Road. That's a Pine Ridge. That's a state park. Pine Knob Road, which is a road that runs uh, adjacent with the Skyline Road, did all this other activity I, that's occurred that I can talk about for another hour or two. There was a place I discovered up there that we had discovered as a group, but no one was investigating in 2010. I went back up there in 2015 and uh, started investigating this particular area. And I think I was finding a meeting area. I don't know how I can describe it any other way, but every time I went there, I'm finding numerous structures of every kind you can think of. And these are some super structures. I mean, these were some doozies and they were in this almost like a 200 foot area. And they had, you're talking horizontal trees that were positioned across the top of limbs. Uh, there was TP structures. There was the, uh, the star structure, the, uh, yeah, the multi stacking structure. There was numerous X's. There was numerous bows. Everything you can think of as a structure was pretty much in this contained in this area. So I got my, uh, I had two of these wild game innovation, uh, uh, game cameras that I had bought in 2009 and I had taken and put them in different areas over the a couple of years up until 2015 and they had captured thousands of different images like birds and bees and anything else that moved in front of it leaves and everything so the cameras work perfectly and i baited the area which i reluctantly do i'm not a big baiter but i decided let's see if i can entice something to get in front of my cameras and i i put i went to aldi's and i got two jars of peanut butter cheap peanut butter uh, uh the, the crunchy and the smooth and i took and took the lid off of one and i positioned it in a wedge of a tree about hmm, six seven eight foot in the air because i pulled the tree down where i could reach it and the other one i left the lid just barely threaded on and i put him a little bit further in another wedge and then i was sticking apples off of uh i, I broke some twigs off of the limbs high and i was sticking apples that i had and i baited that area then i took my other camera up the, uh, and on the other air on the other side of this area away from the camera that i did the first baiting and i duplicated that and i put my cameras there for about three weeks and i'm getting like i said black bear deer you name it i'm picking up some great little images uh but no bigfoot and then that was over a period of two and a half months. I'd go up there about every three weeks to change your batteries in the camera if needed, get an SD card, change that out, and just keep a check on things, rebate it, and nothing too special. And I, my cameras have a, uh, a metal uh, guard that goes around there and secures it with a, with a cable that supposedly is a, a security cable. And then I, I uh, padlock it to the trees and then I was spraying it down with uh, this earthen smell that you wouldn't smell the metal or anything. And then I put a whole bunch of uh, camouflage on each of the cameras to try to somewhat hide them from anything, noticing them right away. So I left that situ that scenario going on in this area for over about two months and everything was fine. And all of a sudden I go up there to check my cameras and both my cameras are destroyed, not physically, but the, the, the electronics are destroyed because I, I, tur I replaced the batteries and I pushed all the buttons. Nothing's working. Well, when I brought it back home, yeah, the boards are fried. Something fried my boards and I don't know what it, but both cameras are destroyed. And I got, I, one of them had a white blur image was the last picture on the SD card was a white blur image on it. And then nothing else was ever taken. So I bought two more cameras of the same type out of a sporting goods store online out of Wisconsin, got them a couple of days later, went back up there, put those cameras in there. Two weeks went by. I went back up and those cameras were destroyed the same way. Something, something, <laughs> 
fried my cameras, all four of them, and nothing like that had ever happened before. Yeah, that is unusual, and that happens to me a lot too. And I get batteries that go dead and electronics that fail all the time out in the brush. It's a strange thing, but it's hard to say if it's Sasquatch, but definitely something strange for sure. Well, being that that was a, like I said, it had so many of these crazy structures in that immediate area and other things that had, I had had experiences there. I know of one place where a guy had had one scream like a banshee at him in the woods back in 89 or 80, 88, 89. He had had him and his two buddies were, were like sitting out. They weren't camping, but they had built a, a little campfire and they were in a little pull off right across where this happened was across Pine Knob Road on the other side of the woods. And this thing out there that one of them saw looked like a, a crazy, it looked like a wild man. It didn't look like a Bigfoot. It looked like a wild man with hair all over its body, screaming like a banshee come out of the woods and <laughs> terrified him. But that happened in that area. And then I had found three or four different tracks over the years that I had been in that area. Uh, in 2010 and then back up there in 2015, I had found some 14 by seven tracks, but I just wondered why that area, because like I said, I put those, the first two cameras that I had in at least three different wooded areas for long times, long t yeah, length of times and nothing ever happened to them. They just took great pictures. Batteries went dead. When I got back, sometimes it, I had to uh, replace more, more often than I expected, but nothing physically had ever happened to my cameras until that position at that place and then i lose four cameras the same way i that just i have no answer for that <laughs> yeah yeah that is unusual okay Dwayne. well i think we hit the end of this last segment of the interview um if we want to do a part three i'm certainly up for it i can tell that you definitely have a lot more that you want to share but unfortunately we reached the end of part two but I'll leave that up to you if you want to do part three and I'll just let you contact me and we'll set it okay. up. Okay. I certainly could probably fill another hour more and I'm, I'm going to, like I said, to a big foot event this weekend and I'm actually going to get to meet. I don't know if you know who Robert W. Morgan is. He's like the, one of the utmost veteran researchers. He started his research in 57 between him and Peter Burns, they're the two oldest guys that, that started Bigfoot. Well, he's going to be here in Pittsburgh uh, for a sportsman, uh, yeah, a sportsman outdoor sportsman show, and I'm going to go meet the guy and talk to him. So I may have some new information the next time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that sounds like a lot of fun. All right, Dwayne. Well, it was a pleasure having you on the show as a guest again. And I know the crowd definitely enjoyed all your experiences encounters and your research that you've done well thank you miguel i appreciate uh, uh, everything i appreciate the invitation and the time and thank you for your your uh, patience and questions and i certainly thank your uh, listeners and appreciate their questions and uh, i'm as i've said i've got you know they can send me questions i'll try to answer them and uh, i appreciate their comments and uh, thank everybody so everybody have a good one and just keep on keeping the Bigfoot research strong. Yeah, absolutely. And you be safe out in the woods. Thank you. You also. And I will talk to you again soon. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Dwayne, thank you again for coming on the show and talking about your reports and experiences. I think if you keep researching those areas, you will one day see a Sasquatch. I found it interesting he said the activity was at an all-time high and then just sort of fizzled out and stopped all of a sudden. That has always been my experiences with these creatures. It seems like they show up out of nowhere and then months or years later they disappear never to be seen again. It was good to hear Dwayne's struggles with his research and I was glad to hear his story and how he overcame all those obstacles. If you ever end up having an eye sighting please contact me. I would be glad to post it on the page. I really like Dwayne and he reminds me of the John Bendernagel of the East Coast. He's full of good information and has a really good way of analyzing things and breaking them down. I wanted to mention I'm releasing a new film 
very soon, so be sure to look out for that in the near future. Alright, that's all I have for now, and I really appreciate Dwayne taking the time out of his day to share his info with all of us. You guys take care, be safe, and thanks for watching. yours and come my way. Huh? Get yours and come my way. Get my what? Your flare. Are we coming back? Yeah. Huh? What that? Do it again. Do your yell again. Thank <laughs> you.